show, Five Eighty Sports Talk, going up on a on a Tuesday. Brendan Dewarson, Dan Dewarson, Ben Ben, ben Dewey, Dewey, all, all joining you today. today. Thank you so much, so much for spending some of your hours, hours with, us with us on the program. program. We've, We've got, got a bunch, bunch to get you on Five Eighty Sports Talk this afternoon. A college basketball-filled opening hour of the show. We've got a new national champion. Same as the old national champion, UConn goes back to back. We'll recap the national championship game coming up here in a moment. Look ahead a little bit to the 24-25 season. And frankly, some really surprising optimism about the Kansas Jayhawks from a national perspective. We will get to that. Also the latest from the SBC and the fact that... Well, John well, Calipari is officially, is officially done, done and Kentucky, and Kentucky he will, he will eventually end up at, at Arkansas. Arkansas. What, what is Kentucky going, going to do? To me, there's one guy. guy. There's one realistic home run high. And if they don't hit it, it, oh boy, it is going to get ugly in Lexington. We'll get to all that here in this opening hour of the show. We'll talk about the Chiefs today as well. It's an NFL draft talk the 3 o'clock hour. Jordan Foot from Arrowhead Report is going to join us as well. Coming up in the 3 o'clock hour. We'll talk to KU with Michael, Michael Swain, Swain for Jayhawk Talk. We at the bottom of the 4 o'clock hour today, as we always do on Tuesday afternoons. Got the Royals to give you. Royals are in action tonight, taking on the Houston Astros. Game one of their series. We've got the Royals tickets for later in the series to give away later on in the show today. All that and a whole lot more coming up on 580 Sports Talk between now and 6 o'clock. We'd love for you to be a part of the show. You know how to do it. Hit us up on the Top City Metal Supply text line, 785-272-9429. Or you can join us on YouTube. 580 Sports Talk is the name of our YouTube channel. Head over to YouTube.com for 580 Sports Talk. Subscribe if you haven't already. We're getting close to 500. We would love to hit that number here in the near future. So go subscribe to YouTube if you haven't already. And you can hang out with us and... Jump, Jump into, into the comment, comment section on YouTube, YouTube as well. It's rolling throughout the show today. Before we get started with the national championship game, I did want to give you our first code word of the day for the Alpha Media Choose Your Trip competition over at or contest if you want to. 580www.com. Right in the middle of the page, you will see the link to the Choose Your Trip contest. You have one hour to input this word. It expires right at 3 o'clock. you got to get it done in the 2 o'clock hour. Your first keyword of the day is airplane. A-I-R-P-L-A-N-E. Airplane. So go enter that over at www.com. And you will be entered into the Choose Your Trip contest from Alpha Media. Where you will take an airplane. You will indeed take an airplane. Well, I mean... I guess, I guess technically, technically corporate probably wouldn't, wouldn't be sad if you didn't want to fly. Yeah. You were, you were like, like, yeah, I, I want to go out to, I just want to have a shopping weekend in Tulsa. Like, I just really want to go see Little Jerusalem in Oakley. I'm like, okay. I just want to drive eight hours to Denver. Yeah, we'll just, we'll pay your gas. That's fine. I'd like, I would like to take the Amtrak. <laughs> no. No. Is that I like would a not do the from, from this area. Like, can you get on the Amtrak from Kansas City? I think yeah, can. in Kansas City, you can. I don't know if it stops in anywhere in Topeka. Topeka. I, you, you can in Lawrence. The uh, the, the train, train station in Lawrence, you can get on the Amtrak. I did it one time, and it sucked. I am extremely anti modern state Amtrak. It is very bad. Have you taken an Amtrak before? I have not. I almost took one home from Marshall because it stops. In mm-hmm. DC, yeah. yeah, but I never did. Yeah, because yeah. it takes like twice the time it would take to drive. Didn't miss anything. It is the absolute worst. So, so that's your keyword. We'll have another one for you at three, four, and five o'clock today. Last night, UConn does what everybody said they definitely could do, and they beat Purdue. UConn back to back national champions. It's kind of incredible how open and honest all of the players and. Bobby Hurley, or I'm sorry, Danny Hurley, were after the game talking about their strategy. Just take out everyone who's not Zach Eady. Like you, you can let Zach Eady do his thing. That's fine. He can score. That's that's whatever. But just don't let the guards do anything. And guess what? And guess what? The guards, the guards did not do anything. They were they were terrible. terrible. They didn't even. It's not that they didn't make a bunch of threes. They didn't even shoot three. They were one for seven. From, from behind, behind the three-pointer. Three in, in this, this is, is 2024, 2024, and they, they shot seven three-pointers in a 40-minute regulation, regulation basketball game. 
and only made one of them. Um, I have some thoughts about that. First of all, yes, great defensive game plan. UConn uniquely situated to be able to guard Zach Eady one-on-one in a way that maybe no other team in the country could do. UConn could do it because Donovan Klingon is just about as tall at seven foot two, and he's the best defensive player in the country. So they decided they could live with it because physically they could match up with Eady in a way that pretty much nobody else could. Mm-hmm. And when you're guarding one-on-one, that means you're not helping, doubling down, digging as uh, in the parlance of the game, and you're not leaving any of the shooters wide open. Purdue shot 40% from three as a team this year, mostly because they got a bunch of wide open looks off the double teams of eating in the post. And you kind of said, well, what if we just don't give them any of those? What, what if we, we just don't give them the opportunity to make any three-pointers? Because not this, is thought, this is the other thing that – UConn decided and correctly deduced. We're a better offensive team than they are. We've got more ways to score. We've got more ways to do damage. We will be more efficient offensively than they will. We'll make them build the entire plane out of two-point shots, and that's not going to be enough to beat us. And in the end of the day, it wasn't. It's a, it was the, they, they turned the game to a very simple math problem. Two would not be great enough to beat three if UConn made their typical – assortment of three-pointers to go along with how efficient they tend to be in their two-point offense. And they were right. And they won this game. I mean, what a flex by uh, Danny Hurley at the end of the night to say, yeah, what, what can we say? We won by a lot again. That's what they did. They won by a lot. They won by 15 points. And it never felt like Purdue uh, was going to make a run. Uh, I will let you folks opine uh, about the game. I have some thoughts about Matt Painter. And the way Purdue uh, approached this game, that I can't wait to get. To. All right, real, real quick, quick. Yeah, this game felt like most of the tournament for UConn. Oh, it did. It, 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 it was a close game. It was a close game, and then boom, pull away. Yeah, yeah. no, no it, exactly. exactly. The Illinois game, game, the Elite Eight, eight was, was just, just like yeah. that. The Final Four game was just, just like that. They go through the filling out process. I saw someone on Twitter compare it to. I don't remember which boxer it was, but it was feel it out for a couple rounds, feel it out for a couple rounds, and then round six, six, boom, you start throwing haymakers. And there's there's nothing anyone can do. This felt like a blowout. It wasn't technically based on the sport, but Purdue was kind of lingering. But at what point? Was there any point in the game where you really felt like, Purdue's got something here? Because outside of the first... Five minutes when I thought, thought okay, okay, maybe, maybe Klingon does, does not have an answer, answer for Edie, and that's going to change what UConn has to do defensively. Because Edie, Edie, I thought, in the first half, especially start of the game, looked really good. I mean, he was pulling out moves that he has not needed to pull out most of the season because he hasn't gone up against seven two dudes all that often. That was a deeper bag than I thought that Edie has, and he was all the way in it for about the first seven, seven and a half minutes. And I think think it was was the the under 12 media timeout. And And Bill Bill Raftery was right on top of it. He said he looked tired on that possession. Yes, he did. And And you you watch watch him going going into the the timeout, like he's like glistening, dripping sweat, and looked like he's trying to get his friends and get his bearings. And that was the point where I realized, all right, he's off to a great start. He just knocked out 40 minutes of this. And they're going to need 40 minutes of exactly this. And if it's anything less, they don't have a chance. So. That's, That's an interesting, interesting point, point you make. The, the under 12 timeout, timeout right? Of the, the first half. That is approximately how much of a game. By the time you get to the under 12 timeout, how, approximately how much of a game has passed? One quarter of it. Yeah. Right? Half of a half, almost. Then after that, the best player on the floor, who I do think was, I think you could argue was Zach Eady. Cam Spencer was great. Tristan Newton was great. Klingon got hot. Eady was really good early on as National Player of the Year. But after that first quarter of the game, the team that has the best roster and the best coach took over, came back, took control, and just stepped on the throat and held their foot there for the entire game. Does that sound at all reminiscent to you of a game that had happened about 28 hours previously on Sunday afternoon when South Carolina beat Iowa for the women's national title? When Caitlin Clark was incredible in the first quarter? And then mm-hmm. South Carolina figured out what they had to do defensively. And then that best roster in the country was able to come back, take a slim lead going into the half, and then just put their foot on the gas and their other foot on the throat of Iowa and pull away with the win. These are the same game. 
Big Except instead Bigger. of Caitlin Clark jacking threes, it was Zach E pulling off step through moves to the basket and looking really good early. Caitlin Clark, ice cold in the second half. I think she was what five for fifteen or five for fourteen in the second half of the women's game. Zach E uh, on a milk carton for most of the second half. On uh, right up until. Purdue raised a white flag and decided that they were going to get Edie's numbers. Yeah, the meaningful portion of that. Sure that I, 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 I want to talk about this. I, I want to talk about the way Matt Painter coached the team. Because, because, look, Purdue, great team, great season. There are a lot of years that team could have won a national championship because they had the ability to shoot and they had an unsolvable problem, the national player of the year in the middle. There are a lot of years that Purdue team wins the national championship. There might even be some years they would have walked to the national title. Mm -hmm. Wasn't happening against this UConn team, who etched their own place in history with the win last night. But UConn outclassed them in every way. They had more depth. They had more size. They were better on the glass. They were better shooting the basketball. They were much better coached. How is it that you allow your team to only shoot seven three-pointers in a regulation basketball game. When you know the game is starting to get away from you. I saw one time, one time in the first 35 minutes of basketball, and it happened late in the second half, where Purdue ran an offensive set that was designed to get a shooter off the screen for a three-pointer. Once! One time, and I know all your looks come from kickouts from Edie out of the double team, the, the, the drive and kick from Braden Smith when the double collapses, and that's how you get all your open three pointers. You don't run some guys off some screens, you don't do some high ball screen stuff. You're trying to come back theoretically in this game. You know, you need three. You know you need to start putting shots up. At some point, don't you say, hey, I've got a bunch of 35 to 45% three-point shooters. I'm going to start running off some screens. I'll set some screens so they can take some dribble handoffs and maybe get some three-point looks. And, and look, Purdue, uh, UConn's so good defensively, it may not have mattered. But don't you try? Instead, instead, what Purdue spent the last 10 minutes doing was dumping it into Edie so he could get his points. I am convinced that Matt Painter ran up the white flag with 10 minutes to go and said, yeah, we had nothing for these boys. Let's just make sure. Maybe, maybe we can get Edie. Maybe we can steal most outstanding player in the tournament for Edie if he gets 40 again. Let's 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 just dump it inside, and we'll take our two. We, we sure as hell can't stop from scoring two on the other end. It's very strange to not deviate from – I mean, it, realistically, why not just start chucking? What what what, yeah. what is functionally different at the end of the game? You lose by twenty five, and so what? You still lose. I, 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 Greg Doyle writes a slightly less glowing column in the Indianapolis Star about your ass is getting kicked. Like who? So what? Some Brad, Brad Underwood did the same thing in the Elite Eight. The same thing. Where until the game was decided and over, when you come on that thirty to nothing run, their approach was to attack. Donovan Klingon, the best, bare minimum, defensive big man in the country, if not the best defensive player, period, in the country, certainly the most influential. He even said on the broadcast to, I think it was Andy Katz, who was on the, the sideline crew for, for that broadcast team, said, I mean, if Klingon blocks eight, nine shots, like, whatever, we're still going to run our stuff. That's very dumb. Yeah. That is very stupid. You have Terrence Shannon playing like crazy. I know I'm referencing an old game here. He's shooting the ball well. You've got other guys who can shoot. You can move the ball around. You've got these talented players. Why are you trying to get downhill on Donovan Klingon? Same principle in this game. Why are you continuing to do the same thing over and over and over again, but it's not working? That doesn't... You don't get a, a chance to bounce back from this game, right? Like, you, you don't have Nebraska coming to town this weekend, and you've got a bounce back opportunity. No, this is it. Yeah. And very likely, statistically speaking, this is the one chance you got. You are, and maybe Purdue gets back. Maybe there's another, you know, seven foot giant. Maybe the next they, Isaac Haas or Zach Eady they, is coming down the pipe. They do have seven to. Who's going to play next year? And they, they got a freshman coming in who's seven three. And so maybe they keep, they keep doing it. Maybe they're able to make it back again. But statistically speaking, the odds of making it back to a title game slim, very slim. Why not go down swinging? Purdue did not go down swinging. I don't think they did at all. I don't know how you can look at a halftime stat sheet if you're Matt Painter and see that your team is one for four from. I think they were one of four at halftime, and say, 
A, we got to find a way to shoot for more from behind the arc. One, that is a strength. It is not as though Purdue came in as a 29% three-point team, and we, we're just not going to do that because that's not how we win games. No, being a 40% three-point shooting team means that is a big part of how you win games. You need to get Lance Jones loose. You need to get Mason Gillis some looks. You need to run Foster Lawyer off some screens and get some catch-and-shoot stuff going because this is 2024, and you cannot win a basketball game in the year of our Lord, 2024, by going one for seven from three-point. You can't do it. It's not possible. I don't care how good your big man is. I don't care how many points he scores. He could score every time down. He basically did in the final 10 minutes of that basketball game. Didn't matter a lick. I thought that was I thought it was poor coaching. And and look, I don't have anything personally against Matt Painter. I know I have uh I've said some things about Purdue and their players and watching them play. I'm not a fan, but it's not personal. Just, just like it's not really personal with Iowa State. I don't like watching them play. I don't like watching Purdue play. It's not personal with me and Matt Painter. It's not. He seems like a like a, a hail fellow well met. He really does. But I thought that was irresponsible. I thought that was really poor coaching. I thought that was coaching to not get embarrassed by the time the second half rolled around. And that's really shameful in a national championship game to me. It is. A- Again, what is the harm in going for it and taking more risks, especially when the game is effectively decided at that point anyway? Why not Why not try? Why, why not do something different? It, Literally, look, look okay. directly at the box score. Purdue scored exactly 30 points in both halves. Like, n- nothing changed. Literally nothing changed. Mm-hmm. And conversely, Danny Hurley, where do we put him now when we talk about great coaches in America? Up there. Top three. Are we sure? Top, uh, he ain't three. I'll tell you that right now. Oh, you, uh, yeah, I, I was using like a top three, top five, top ten kind of model. Are we sure talking is. about at this exact moment or like over the last like? Yeah, like, like full body of work up to April 9th, 2024. I mean, it's him and Bill Sell. Yeah. Yes. I, I don't have an argument for anyone else. Yeah. Yes. All the other great ones have retired. And it's not just the winning either. Like, because there have been some coaches who've won and have a history of, of winning, but then you look at kind of the stuff they run and it's not like overly impressive. Like John Calipari stuff was revolutionary in its day and now kind of feels stale. Like you wouldn't call mm-hmm. Cal right now a, a particularly innovative or great X's and O's coach. You would say that about Bill Self. He's always been a great X's and O's guy. He's been able to evolve with the times. Dan Hurley is an outstanding X's and O's coach. The way they were breaking down what UConn runs offensively on mm-hmm. the on the TBS halftime and post game, that is art, man. It's like a uh, CJ Moore wrote the article about it, the definitive article uh, about uh, the UConn offense on the Athletic, where Dan Hurley explained to him that they call plays. They're like NFL plays, where you've got like your formation essentially, and then you've got four different actions that that are all going on at the same time, mm-hmm. and something's going to come open. And it's the responsibility of the players to find the open shot and take the best available shot. And, man, they do that every time. Did did they take a bad shot last night? No, Raph pointed that out, too, that they are willing to pass up an okay shot to go get a great one all the time. In principle, that's what Ben McCollum did at Northwest Missouri State for all those years before Mm -hmm. now taking the job at Drake. The idea was we're going to pass. We're not going to dribble a whole lot. We're going to pass, pass, pass. Good shots are not good enough. We need great shots. They, They won a lot. UConn wins a lot. And I think that's a big reason why I would consider him. And if you don't consider him one of the best coaches these days, I'm not not really sure what and, you're watching and, or what you're looking at. But the ability to grow and adapt and to keep building on it and getting better. It's why Self's been a great coach mm-hmm. for forever. Because as much as you know he would love to send out Hunter Dickinson with another big man next year and essentially play two centers, two seven footers, he's not going to do that. And it's going to be a more athletic team. It's going to be a team that shoots might not like that style of basketball, but he knows that's what wins. That's what won him a title two years ago. And back to Hurley for a second. If we can separate the admiration for our, for the success, the, the X's and O's, it, whatever colorful term you'd like to use to describe Dan Hurley's personality on the sideline, uh, number one, uh, you'd be correct. The the colorful terms that I'm thinking of are not ones we can say behind a microphone. Uh, but number one, you'd be right. Number two, Dan Hurley would be the first one to tell you that you were right because he is those things. Uh, to try and be less colorful, he is a jerk. 
He is a whiner. He does yell at the officials way too much. He did almost get into it with Edie during a media timeout in a way that was not flattering. He's very lucky. Then he, he got called for a foul because he pushed his player. Yeah. Yeah, he's very lucky he didn't get a tee that first time he was barking at Edie. Like, you, you don't, don't see that very often. I do not think he is a particularly warm and cuddly character in that way. Like, if he's your guy, he's your guy, and, and you can't are going to ride with this dude till the death. And they should. But... Like, you're not wrong if you say, yeah, I just don't like him. He just rubs me the wrong way. Yeah, yeah. I think he, I think rubbing people the wrong way is just kind of part and parcel of the Dan Early experience at this point. But for what he's been able to do, win relentlessly, not just win these last two NCAA championships. They were never tested. Nobody gave him a game. They won every game the last two years by at least 13 points. No one had ever done that once before. And they did it two years in a row. It's remarkable stuff. It's 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 an all time, and I'm curious where you guys put this UConn team. To me, they're the best team that I've seen since 2018 Villanova. And part of my part of how I rank 2018 Villanova is getting to see them up close and personal, getting to be in the building when they just nuked KU to death with those 18 three pointers in that national semifinal. But to me, that's kind of been. I don't want to say the modern gold standard because there have been some other, like, obviously that 38-1 Kentucky team, even though they didn't finish the deal, that's an all-time great college team. The Anthony Davis Kentucky team is an all-time great college team. 08 Kansas, to me, is an all-time great college team. But this 2024 UConn team stands with them. And, and I, I think they're the best team we've seen win this tournament since uh, Villanova in 2018. I think they're probably better than that team. If I'm not mistaken, the only team with a better Ken Palm ranking at the end of the season – in maybe in the entire Ken Palm era, but at least in the last 20 years, the only one better than that KU team in 2008 is this year's UConn team, which is astounding. And I think that KU team gets overlooked because they didn't dominate the championship game. Mm-hmm. But Me- Memphis was also really good. That was the first time we ever had all one seeds in the Final Four. Like, yeah, you should have tough games when you get to that Final Four. Um, I would take Villanova, I think. The one difference being, if a game got to a shootout, I would take Villanova. Because Villanova was a better three-point shooting team. Than yes, yes. That's the one difference. They could, they could play that five out in a way that the teams that they ran into really couldn't play that five out. They were one of the first college teams to really be able to play that effectively. Mm-hmm. The thing is with UConn, I think they could defend it. I think Klingon's a good enough defender that he could credibly guard the five out. Like, I, I think he moves. Put him on Haskell? Yes. I, I think he moves well enough that he can get out and contest threes and, and guard ball screens. I, I love you, Doka, as a to death. Probably better at that than Doak. Yes. One, uh, <laughs> there's a reason, there's a reason that you know Kazabuke is a, is a two-way contract guy in the mm-hmm. league. And I think Zach Eadie's going to be a two-way contract guy in the NBA. And Dominic Klingon's a lottery pick. Like, big difference. Yeah. Big difference. The way they move, uh, the way they defend around the rim, the way they defend ball screen coverage. Like, if you watched Klingon versus Edie last night, like, you saw, I think, both sides of the equation. You saw why Edie's been such a dominant college player, why he deserved to be national player of the year two years in a row. You also saw why NBA teams want Donovan Klingon more than they want a Zach Edie. Mm-hmm. And I get it. I do understand it. Coming up next, we've got more college basketball to get to. Michael Swain will join us later. Jordan Foote will join us later on in the program as well. We're just getting started here on 5 Sports Talk. <laughs> Or just want to update your inventory of farm, construction, or fleet equipment, then don't wait. Visit purplewave.com today. Purple Wave Auction. Straight, simple, sold. An estimated 1,000 tornadoes occur each year in the U.S. and 36 shark attacks. And that's why we keep you constantly updated on severe weather that could become tornadic instead of giving you shark warnings. Oh, an ocean beach would be nice. Stay connected and you'll stay safe. Know what's coming before it gets here. Severe weather coverage you can count on on WIBW. Are you stressed about your IRS tax problems? Have you received notices from the IRS threatening to garnish your wages, levy your bank accounts, or seize your property? 
you need an ally. Allies Tax Relief has tax attorneys and enrolled agents that are ready to fight for you. They have saved millions for taxpayers just like you. Allies Tax Relief can help to stop from IRS collection and most importantly, negotiate your tax debt. Here's Brenda, a happy client of Allies Tax Relief. I owe the IRS $57,000, and they're about to start garnishing my paychecks. I heard a commercial on the radio about Allies Tax Relief, so I thought I'd get one. After a day, they were able to at least stop the garnishing. And after a few months of negotiations, I walked away owing the IRS only $301. If you owe the IRS, call Allies Tax Relief right now for your free consultation. Call 800-230-5174. 800-230-5174. That's 800-230-5174. All across the country, people are coming together to speed up what we can learn. Yeah, something is going on with the audio, but I don't know what the fix is. It's probably hmm. one million people to join us as we try to change the future of health. We're family. We're future generations. We're all this. Visit joinallofus.org and find out how you can become one. W-I-B-W, Topeka. We've been made aware if you are watching the show on YouTube today or via our website, 580 There's a bit of an issue with audio. We'll get that fixed uh, as soon as we can figure out what the issue is. If you're listening on 580 AM or 4.9 FM or online through the audio stream at 580 uh, I think you're all good. Shouldn't, shouldn't sweat. So uh, lucky you today. We will get to uh, some Chiefs talking in the 3 o'clock hour. We'll talk Royals later on in the show today as well. Royals Astros series opener coming up tonight. We've got some tickets to give away courtesy of our friends at the deepest well more injury attorneys as well. But as soon as the game went final last night, I really could have posted this stuff with like 10 minutes to go in the game. The odds for next year's national champion dropped from sportsbooks across the country. And, and also, our pal CJ Moore and company and the athletic, athletic dropped, dropped there way, way too, too early, early top, top 25 for next, next season. season. We'll, we'll get, get to CJ and Sam of the Athletic, the athletic in a moment. moment. The, 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 the odds, the, the gambling, gambling houses. houses. This, this is, is fan duel, okay? Biggest favorite for the national, national title. Who do you think it is? UConn. No. no. UConn comes in sixth. Okay, it's Duke. It's Duke. Cooper flag, flag, number one recruit in the country. country. They're going to have a bunch of dudes coming in. They're, They're number one. one. Plus 1,100. Plus 1, you put down 100 bucks, they win. They win 1,100 back. Who you know the second shortest the odds belong to? The, the way, way you're, you're asking, at? I'm guessing it's the Kansas Jayhawks. It's KU. That's odd, right? Like I, I'm as optimistic about KU, KU every year as anybody, anybody but, but that's... that's that's strange, strange right? right? That, that KU would have, have the second shortest odds, odds not, not knowing what this final roster is going to look like? like? I, I, I wouldn't bet KU, KU in that, that spot. spot. Yeah, I, I think there's still some uncertainty, uncertainty about what the roster, roster will, will like, look like. But at the, but same, at the same time, time like if you have like a guess what the roster is going to look like right now, you're going to have one of the most experienced point guards in the country who started for a national champion. You're going to have a... All American at center and two impact transfers in the starting lineup to go with the guy who's a three year starter in KJ Adams. Like to me, that feels like a pretty good first five to bet on. And I'm sure KU's not done in the portal. Uh, they, they could still have Johnny Furphy stay. Uh, the freshman class, you would hope, be more impactful than, uh, than this previous year's freshman class in the end. Like, like Again, Again you, there's, there's so, so much uncertainty, uncertainty at this point with what a roster is really going to look like <laughs> that if you're setting odds right this second, you kind of bank on the brands to get it figured out, right? Like right. You would bank on the brands to be able to uh, pull their rosters through the unknown and come out in good shape for the upcoming season. So that that's what it is. It's just the, the equity that Kansas has built up, which is fair, but I... Kane needs to do more. I, I, I think, think that's, 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 that's everyone, everyone would, would agree with that. Because you're going to take a step back defensively. Take a step back defensively you're not going to have Kevin McCullough. I like Zeke Mayo a lot. I think he's going to be a good player. I like Riley Kugel a lot. I think he's going to be a good player. We'll talk to Michael Swain a little bit later about some other guys that KU might be targeting or what kind of player KU might be targeting. I think KU is going to be a national championship picture, by the way. Or 
or no, drum, no, drum season. season. I just don't I just know, don't know right if now, right now I would say, I would yes. say yes. Second, the second most, most likely, likely to win, to win a, title. a title next year would be Kansas. That that would surprise me a little bit. And that is a perfect segue into the premature way too early top 25 from cj moore and sammy over, over at, at the, the athletic. athletic they, they have, have a grand total, total of six big 12 teams not, not the top the top 25, 25. In, the in the top, top 15. 15 houston, houston three, three iowa, iowa state, state four, four ku, KU seven, seven arizona, arizona 11, 11 byu 13, 13 baylor, baylor 15. 15. that, that is, is overwhelming <laughs> I don't know that I necessarily agree with all of those, but I would not also not be completely shocked if we saw the first AP poll of next year and saw all of those teams in the top 15 or 20. So I think these teams have, like, all of them have questions. Mm -hmm. I think the team probably with the fewest questions is Iowa State. I mean, they've got, like, their playmakers are all coming back, and they're going to probably need to recruit another big, but – they feel real good about their like the, what they have as far as returning production, probably more than any of these other schools that we're talking about here. Um, they can feel really, really good about that. Houston obviously has to replace the Big 12 Player of the Year. That won't be easy. Replacing, replacing Jamal Shedd and <laughs> everything that he was and everything that he meant. KU has to replace an All-American, and, and they have to get a little bit deeper. Obviously, they still they started that process, but they're not done yet. Arizona's lost two starters to the portal in Kylan Boswell and Omar Ballo, and it looks like they're going to just replace Ballo with a true freshman or a sophomore who didn't play much last year. I mean, all the best. This is a, this is a league where veterans win, and if you want to go young, I mean, I'm sure those players are going to be good, but they might struggle against a more veteran league. BYU, of course, doesn't have that problem with veterans at all. They, they're all their guys are twenty five years old. Um, they, they brought back the Egyptian Jokic, uh, Ali Khalifa, and a bunch of shooters. That they'll be good. Baylor is going to lose probably three starters to the NBA draft, but they continue to reload, and they ha right now have been the program as good as any in the league at finding freshmen who are plug and play. I well, the, the other question is, um, is Scott Drew going to be at Baylor? We will get to that here in the next couple of minutes. I think it's going to be another great year for the Big 12, obviously. There's a long way to go this offseason. Fans get so worked up about the transfer portal and well, big name is it. Why haven't they committed already? Well, we need another we need a backup big man. Why why hasn't this guy committed already? Because it's a long offseason. There's a lot of time to go. And you may not have noticed this, but the arguably the biggest program in the the sport they don't have a coach right now and they've already lost one recruit they have another one who has opened their commitment they had a starter from this year two starters in fact or at least a part-time starter who have already entered the transfer portal a lot is going to change. A lot is going to shift. There are going to be exit meetings for teams that made deep runs into the NCAA tournament. Don't freak out just quite yet if your team has not landed every single prospect you wanted out of the portal. I'm talking to you, Kansas fans. I'm also talking to UK State fans. I, I was perusing the uh, the GOAT Power Cap boards the other day. We were, I think it was before Doug McDaniel committed. And that was pretty quick, all things considered. The Doug McDaniel, it was what, two weeks maybe? And I saw someone on the boards on an hour before the, his official commitment saying, that they were losing faith in the K-State coaching staff because they hadn't, hadn't landed anybody. Like, <laughs> there's not enough Xanax in the world if that you're that kind of fan. Like, if you're going to get so paranoid about that, then while the calendar is barely into April, you are panicking about the transfer portal. Like, there's no fix for that. But, that being said, uh, there's a chance that K-State might have some good news coming down the pipes? Yeah, uh, happened to see this from uh, the folks at MGoBlog. That is uh, a leading Michigan uh, news source. Uh, they obviously have a new head coach and have been eyeing the portal both for incoming transfers and for their outgoing guys. 
they previously felt like there was a slight chance that Terrace Reed might come back to Michigan. Uh, they're off that now uh, in an article that was posted uh, within the last 24 hours. Uh, the uh, site's editor, Brian Cook, writing that uh, Terrace Reed, quote, seems likely to pick Kansas State any day now. So that is the hasn't been a lot from the Kansas State side uh, about uh, that recruiting. We haven't heard much from uh, from any K State insiders regarding that bit of business. But uh, that's one tied in source from the Michigan side saying, yeah, that feels pretty inevitable that indeed Kansas State is going to get their big man uh, in Terrace Reed. It's an interesting proposition here because are they players of need in McDaniel and Reed for K State? Yes. Absolutely. Are they good players? Well, on, on paper, certainly. Now, for what it's worth, I think adding McDaniel is a more important ad, or is a, a better ad than Terrace Reed. I'm, I think Reed is more of a body, whereas I think McDaniel is more of a difference maker. That being said, I think those are good additions and that they're what K-State needs. But also, they were key players on a Michigan team that wasn't bad, sucked last year. They were awful last year so that's one other thing you know but that's that's the portal right is that you're never going to end up with exactly the perfect fit every single thing you want because if you could get that they wouldn't be in the transfer portal they would either be staying with their program or they would be going to the nba so it's just don't don't freak out yet honestly i think if k-state is able to land reed and again they need a body down low more than anything if you add Reed and McDaniel, KU has already added Kugel and Mayo. Those are good off seasons already. I do think there are a lot more positives than negatives coming for both these teams in the transfer portal. Uh, just there's, there's time. Don't don't freak out quite yet. But also, why well, I wouldn't bet on anyone to win the national championship quite yet, let alone just KU. Coming up next, some big news out of Lexington, Kentucky. It's official. Cal is out and is likely headed to Arkansas soon. What does that mean? Who are the favorites for the job? We'll get to that coming up on Five Eighty Sports Talk. Brendan, Dan, and Spencer here with you on 580 Sports Talk. Thanks for spending some of your afternoon hours with us. 
John Calipari, after finally figuring out how to upload a video to Twitter earlier on today, did make it official. He is leaving the Kentucky program. And Big Blue Nation will be searching for a new head coach. Uh, Cal said it's time for a new voice. I'm walking away, yada, yada. I mean, yeah, he's, he's going to end up in Arkansas. That's where this is all pointing to. There was a report earlier today that he had not even spoken yet to Kentucky, and that's why this whole thing was being held up because he's got a clause in his contract that he has to inform Kentucky if he is negotiating with another school. That's kind of odd, but so be it. So now that he's gone, Kentucky's got a head coach opening. This is from Matt Jones, who runs Kentucky Sports Radio, KSR, if you will. His tier one candidates, or at least Kentucky's tier one candidates for the Wildcats head coaching job. Dan Hurley, Billy Donovan, Scott Drew. Tier two, Sean Miller, Shaka Smart, Chris Beard. When I saw that list earlier today, that told me precisely one thing. If it is not Scott Drew, this is going to be a disaster for Kentucky. A complete and unmitigated disaster. Dan Hurley is not taking this job. No. He made that very clear last night. Yes. And it should have been clear anyway, to be honest with you. Billy Donovan is not leaving the NBA. It's what it sounds like more and more that uh, actually he's kind of digging life fighting for the ninth seed in the Eastern Conference every year, which, I mean, on the bright side, didn't have to deal with NIL. This is from Joe Cowley of the Chicago Sun-Times, who covers the Bulls for the Sun-Times. Pedro Grafal, the manager of the White Sox, was being kept this year because the White Sox didn't want to pay his buyout. They were so bad last year. They, Jerry Reinsdorf, who owns the White Sox, believed that it was worth keeping Pedro Grafal so he didn't have to pay him a buyout for firing him before his contract expired. You know who Jerry Reinsdorf also owns? The Chicago Bulls. He cares about the White Sox more than he cares about the Bulls. He ain't firing Billy Donovan, who's got two more years on his contract. Billy Donovan ain't leaving to go back to college unless all NBA options are exhausted. That's not happening. I will tell you right now, Billy Donovan is not going to coach in college basketball again unless he becomes persona non grata to the NBA, which he has not for the Chicago Bulls, as much as that kind of disappoints me. He's not going anywhere. Can you imagine Shaka Smart at Kentucky? No. No chance. Can you imagine Sean Miller at Kentucky? <laughs> like, the whole thing at Kentucky is we ran John Calipari off because the uh, – the returns were diminishing. We weren't winning in the tournament anymore. We haven't been to the second weekend since 2019. We haven't been to a final four since 2015. Yeah. You know who I associate with rousing NCAA tournament success? It ain't those two guys. Nope. Nope. It's, uh, I, I th this is a disaster for Kentucky if they can't land Scott Drew. For what it's worth, I don't think it's impossible they get Scott Drew. I, I think that is certainly in the realm of possibility. From everything I have read, Mitch Barnhart, the AD at Kentucky, is a huge Scott Drew fan. They have very similar personal, off-the-court, you know, beliefs on life and religion and things like that. They're very similar in that regard, I guess. Apparently, some Kentucky boosters have been big fans of Scott Drew for quite some time. He's obviously a good head coach. He's been able to recruit really well as of late. And at Kentucky, he can recruit just as well, if not better. You know what he's done at Baylor at you know, we associate John Calipari with being, he's the guy that gets you to the league. He's the guy that the best freshmen want to go play for because he gets you to the NBA. Scott Drew quietly has been doing that at Baylor, getting mm -hmm. guys to the NBA, getting some of the top one and done guys the last couple of years to go to Baylor to play for him because he's getting guys drafted. He's getting guys to the lottery. We just mentioned they got three guys that are going to go pro, including two true freshmen in Jacoby Walter and, and Eve Misi. So it fits like it, it makes a lot of sense if that's the step that Scott Drew takes, because like we were talking about, I think yesterday when we had this discussion, Scott Drew's done everything you can do at Baylor. There, there's nothing more like the, the minute he's done coaching there, whether it's tomorrow or in five years, 10 years, they should name the court after him and build a statue. Because mm -hmm. we all know we don't need to rehash the the literal horror story of where that program was when he took it over. 
And what it is now is almost entirely him. But there's nowhere higher to go. There's nothing more you can do at Baylor. You're not going to build a dynasty there. You're not going to rack up the kind. You're not going to do the kind of winning you can do at Kentucky at Baylor. The one thing I would say would be a a con, a major con for taking Kentucky and leaving Baylor if you're Scott Drew. When you're at Baylor, you're a lot more insulated than you are at Kentucky. You have the protect, the, the school is always going to support you. You're always going to have that kind of protection. You, you're always going to be treated highly. You're always going to be the king of the mountain. Well, even if you have a couple of down years, if like if Baylor next year is a seven seed in the tournament, they have a couple of years in a row where they are a, a six or a seven, or even they miss the tournament. You know who's going to be calling for Scott Drew's head? No one. No one. Mm-hmm. Can you imagine if in his first year, Kentucky is a five? That people would ask to fire him right away. I can't imagine Kentucky being a five, even though they missed the tournament more recently than Baylor has. Right. Like that, that's what I'm trying to get at, though, is that the pressure and the outside pressure is so different at Kentucky. That might be the one thing. Now, coaches are different. Coaches are a different breed. You might think, no, I want that challenge. I climbed the mountain at Baylor. I got us to the tournament. I won a national championship. I've gotten players to the NBA. I've done all of these things. I want to go do something else now. That might absolutely be what Scott Drew wants to do. That's just the one thing I could think of that would be a, maybe I don't want to test those waters. But otherwise, I think that would be a good hire for Kentucky. I think if you're a Kentucky fan that thinks, ew, Scott Drew, Baylor, I think you're an idiot. I don't think you know anything about basketball. And that's coming from someone who openly despises Scott Drew. I do not like the guy (laughs) at all. I think he's weird. I think he's a little bit overrated. I think his title was fake because it was the COVID year. It was still a national championship. My favorite team got knocked out in the second round of that year's NCAA tournament, okay? Like, somebody had to win it. And I think if you're a Kentucky fan and you don't like it, you don't know ball. Yeah, I, I, that that to me is the best Kentucky can do is, is Scott Drew. That would be the best hire they could make. Based on this list. And yeah, I mean, at, at that point, if they can't get Scott Drew, I mean, I, I don't know what they think Shaka or Sean Miller or Chris Beard is going to do in that job. At that point, just call Patino. I mean, I would. Why? Why, why not? At, at, at that point, just run it back. Hey, we know this works. I... I don't know, man. I I just don't know what you do. There's not right now the obvious guy anymore, right? Like, like when KU hired Bill Self in 2003, it was, it was very obvious. Like everybody knew at the time, like, oh yeah, Bill Self's going to Kansas. I remember being eight years old and it was known that, oh yeah, Bill Self's leaving. He's going to Kansas. Like that, that was just known. Sometimes that happens. That, that guy's not out there if you're Kentucky right now. So I, if they can, if Scott Drew is willing to do it, then I, you give him a blank check and you move on. Seth Davis threw out Mark Few as somebody that if he were Mitch Barnhart, the AD at Kentucky, he would make a call to. I'd make him say no. That's better than Sean Miller. Oh yeah, easily better than Sean Miller. Easily, a lot of people are better than options than Sean Miller. That one's ridiculous. So is Shaka Smart though. Those are both ridiculous. Yeah. I, I'd call Mark. Chuck has already been to the state school with infinity resources. He didn't do squat at Texas. No. Like Marquette is his level. Yes. No, that's, that's absolutely correct. I mean, who else do you even think about? Who else, who else is even in the stratosphere that you call? Self ain't going, no No. point in calling self. There's no point in calling John Shire. He he is Duke to the core. You don't call Hubert Davis. He's UNC to the core. How about Brad Stevens? I mean, I guess you you call him. <laughs> you call him. See if he's got the itch. Hey, hey, Brad, I know you, uh, you've you got the number one team in the Eastern Conference right now, and you got out of coaching. What about <laughs> you coming get, back to Kentucky? You want to get back in? You could <laughs> assemble a roster that could probably finish 10th in the Eastern Conference. We will let you still be the GM of the Boston Celtics. <laughs> I have a, a random candidate that has to do with the Celtics, Joe Missoula. Bring, bring Missoula back to do it? I mean, Boston fans probably run him out of town if they yeah, don't make no it to the kidding. finals. If they don't this year. win the title this year, they drive Missoula to the airport. Yeah, there's just nobody who's that obvious pick right now. After Oates very quickly said, no, I'm not interested. I mean, that that was the one. And if he's not going to take it, then I, I don't know what you do if it's not Scott Drew. I 
It would I'll be very play that funny. flag. I think Scott Drew takes it. I do too. I, I think I think if he's offered, Kentucky will make the number big enough. He won't say no. We'll talk plenty of Kansas City Chiefs coming up next hour. Jordan Foote will join us from Arrowhead Report. We've got Random Question Tuesday. Your text, your YouTube comments coming up on 580 Sports Talk.
now it's the three o'clock hour of 580 Sports Talk going up on a Tuesday. Brendan Dorzinski, Dan Lucero, Spencer Dupuis all here with you this afternoon. Thanks so much for hanging out with us today. Whether you're listening on 580 AM, 104.9 FM, online at 580WWW.com or on YouTube, 580 Sports Talk, the name of the channel. We are so thankful for you hanging out with us here today. A lot of football to get to in this hour. It was college basketball heavy in hour number one, Chiefs heavy in hour number two. We'll get to the draft a little bit here coming up in just a moment. Random question Tuesday in a little bit. And Jordan Foote from Arrowhead Report is going to join us as well coming up later on this hour. Good to hear from Jordan. It's been a little while, so we'll catch up with him. Talk a little Royals with him as well. You're welcome to be a part of the show. You can find us on the Top City Metal Supply text line. 785-272-9429 is the name of the text line. From construction sites to renovations, from the farm to the garage, Top City Metal Supply understands the value of precision and cost efficiency. No more wasted materials, no more wasted money, just metal cut to the exact size that you need. Top City Metal Supply can be found on South Topeka Boulevard, just north of Forbes Field here in the capital city. Our YouTube stream is also open today. Head over to 580 Sports Talk on YouTube, and you can go subscribe to our channel and watch along with the show today. Audio has been fixed on the YouTube stream, by the way, so we are rock and yes. rolling. Good. Took a little bit. We got it all figured out, though. Yeah. Spencer, man of the controls, doing all the troubleshooting back there on the other side of the glass, making sure everything's all working out for us today. Before we get to the Chiefs, ladies and gentlemen, it is time for your 3 o'clock hour. Keyword for the Alpha Media Choose Your Trip 2024 contest. You can enter this at our website, 580wibw.com. Click on the Choose Your Trip 2024 link. I just did it very simply. If I was allowed to enter this contest, I would do it right now. All you have to do is enter the keyword, which for the three o'clock hour is money. M O N E Y. Money. That is your keywords. Head to 580wibw.com. Click on choose your trip. Th that's literally the contest. It tells you right in the name what this contest is. You get to choose the trip that you go on. I'm looking at the little graphic here that we have for choose your trip. We see the Statue of Liberty, see Las Vegas. I think that's Arches National Park, some sort of beach landscape, somewhere cold. I would never go somewhere cold and call it vacation or a trip, but nonetheless, all sorts of different places. You get to choose airfare, hotel, all of that. Brought to you by Alpha Media USA. So go enter the keyword money at 580wibw.com. We will talk to Jordan a little bit later on this hour about the NFL draft, where the Chiefs are going to go, the picks they're going to make. The last two mock draft Mondays, yesterday and then last week, eight days ago, the vast majority of what we have seen has the Chiefs going offense in the first round. Last week, it was mostly Kingsley Suamataya, the left tackle from BYU with the 32nd overall pick. This week, almost exclusively wide receivers. We saw Xavier Worthy with a trade up, A.D. Mitchell, both of them from Texas, Lad McConkey from Georgia. Dan, you weren't a huge fan of that. I am curious, though, because I saw this piece today from Arrowhead Pride at SB Nation and Ron Kopp, who wrote three signs the Chiefs will focus on offense during the draft. And he mentioned that this is an offense-friendly draft, left tackle, fairly deep, wide receiver, very deep this year. Day two, a lot of interior offensive linemen who will be available, including my guy Dominic Pooney from KU. All sorts of different offensive playmakers, wide receiver later on, tight end, some running backs in the mix as well. If you need offensive pieces, this is a good draft to go get those offensive pieces. But I was wondering if I might be swimming upstream in the other direction here when I thought, I wonder if the Chiefs are going to focus a little more attention defensively in this class. So I'm curious where you stand. And Dan, we'll start with you here. When, when we get to 16 days from now and the draft starts, if you had to guess, if I told you, all right, which is it going to be? More offensive focus, more defensive focus in this draft, which side of the fence would you fall on? So two ways to look at how to approach the draft. Number one is where are your holes presently? Where are the pieces that you need to plug in? Where, where are the spots that you're looking to find starters or day one contributors? And secondly is where do you need depth? Where is depth, future depth, two, three, four years down the road, uh, looking to potentially be a concern? I think both of those answers are, on the offensive side of the ball. I, I think this is going to be an offense-heavy draft 
for the Chiefs. I think they're going to address tackle. I think they're going to address wide receiver. I'm of the mind those will probably be their first two picks in some order in whatever slots they make them in the first and second rounds. Those, I think, will be the first two positions that they address. I'm also on record saying I think they're going to add a running back to their running back room. And I wouldn't be surprised if there are multiple offensive linemen and multiple wide receivers as, as a part of this class as well. I, I think that's where the holes are. That's where the need for both immediate impact and long-term depth are. So I expect the Chiefs to really focus on the offensive side of the ball at this draft. That's where I was going to. I think the needing another running back, um, I think wide receiver, obviously, offensive line, obviously. Um, I think those are your big key holes in this one, and I think they've done a lot. I, you're going to pick a cornerback late because that's just what they do. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe a defensive lineman late too, but I think most of your draft picks are going to be on the offensive side of the ball, and it makes sense because uh, that's where they need it. And and I think yesterday Matt Verderin made a, a great – take i guess uh on what he said is they only really need a few guys he said Mm -hmm. they can go mess around trade later in the draft i mean your defense is basically set you need to make sure that you know you have a guy to be your number one corner which i think they do uh and you have a lot of depth there so i think maybe you draft a defensive lineman and maybe you draft a cornerback safety combo late in the draft, but I think it's going to be offensive side mostly, most of the entire draft. I think that makes a lot of sense. I think there is a lot of logic behind this. What is your defense going to look like in one to two years? Because you're going to have to rebuild your entire defensive line at some point. Because, yes, you brought back Mike Dana. You've got him for at least two more seasons. Chris Jones locked up long-term. Felix and DK Uzama, he's there for the next couple of years. Last year's first-round pick. Nadi's on a one-year deal. Wharton's on a one-year deal. I don't know how much longer you have Neil Farrell, but he was only active for, what, one or two games all of last season during the regular season. You can't rely on him. Amenahu only has this one final year left on his contract. Nick Bolton at some point is either going to need a new contract or is going to walk away. And I think your defensive backfield, you've at least got some questions about what the future of it looks like. Whereas offensively, yes, a wide receiver will be taken. At least one wide receiver will be taken by the Chiefs in this draft. No doubt in my mind about that. You're set at quarterback, though. At least one of your guards is set. You are going to keep either Humphrey or Smith at least. Maybe both of them if you can make it work with the money. But at least one of those guys is going to be locked up long term. If you take a left tackle or you sign one, maybe maybe that ends up being a long-term issue as well if Wani and Morris isn't the guy. But your right tackle is locked up for the next few seasons. Tight end is an interesting spot because Kelsey's got a few more years on his contract. Noah Gray only has one. Maybe a tight end is a position you target. Maybe Ben Sinnott is a position is a player that you target. We talked about Cooper Beebe yesterday, a K-State guy who could go to the Chiefs. Maybe Ben Sinnott is that guy, and he's your next tight end of the future for Kansas City. I think your future plans offensively are a little bit clearer than they are defensively. I think your core defensive pieces are there, but I think there's some real questions about what the depth looks like and some of the starting positions look like. Maybe not in 24, but 25, 26. So when you're looking to like round three and beyond, when you're more focusing less so on we have to just get the best player available and it's more so, hey, we've got some holes to fill. We need special teamers and we need depth at certain spots. I do sort of wonder if there's a little bit more attention paid to the defensive side of the ball. I just don't think it's as clear cut as the offensive side is, which is, again, aided by the fact that you've got a quarterback who's going to make it work no matter who's out there with him. Yeah, that's the other way that you could look at this if you're the Chiefs and just say, hey, look, look what we just won the Super Bowl with at wide receiver. And we've upgraded meaningfully already with the signing of Hollywood Brown. Maybe they swerve us all and they don't take a wide receiver till day two or day three. And Mm -hmm. it's, you know, a a more of a project type wide receiver. And they're just willing to roll with Hollywood Brown and Rashi Rice. And then whoever else is on hand, Justin Watson, like maybe that's your top three wide receivers next year. Is that like exciting? Not, not, not particularly, although we, we all think Rashi Rice is pretty good. And, and I think Hollywood Brown is going to add something to this offense, but is that as exciting as it would be to like add a AD Mitchell or, or Troy Franklin or, uh, uh, a prospect like that with your first round pick? No, not necessarily. But again, 
when you're talking about the restrictions of the salary cap, one of the things that the salary cap forces teams to do is essentially choose what you're going to spend on and choose what you're going to try and shoestring because you can't spend big bucks at every position. You can do it at a handful of positions. You can invest your draft capital and you can invest your salary cap resources. Mm -hmm. And obviously the chiefs have done that at quarterback. They've done that on the offensive line. They have uh, in the past, they have done that certainly on the defensive line in this off season by giving Chris Jones, his superstar deal. Where have they cheaped out? Traditionally, it's been wide receiver and defensive back. And the reason they've been able to do it at defensive back and nobody raises an eyebrow when they do it at defensive back is because nobody has been better at developing talent at defensive back than the Chiefs have. Wide receiver is a bit of a different story because they didn't really develop anything last year. They just had a bad wide receiver room and said, boy, I hope 15 makes this work. And what do you know? The best quarterback in football made it work. So maybe that's going to be the divining rod for how the Chiefs manage their resources and their draft capital is to say, if we just won a Super Bowl with a wide receiver room like this, why should we invest extensive draft capital, extensive financial resources in the wide receiver position when we can just make it work with day two guys and street free agents? It's worked so far, right? Like, why would you, similar to the defensive back thing, why would you deviate from what has worked? I mean, if it's going to continue being successful for you, I mean, why why go away from that? Can I bring up, by the way, a uh, and we'll talk to Jordan a little bit later on. He wrote about a mock draft that was from Pro Football Network earlier today. I think I might kind of love this one. It doesn't really address offensive tackle all that well. It would This one would be in a situation where you probably go back out and you bring back Donovan Smith or or a similar player. First overall pick for the Chiefs. So number 32 overall, Byron Murphy, the defensive tackle from Texas. Would you be all right with that? I like Byron Murphy a lot, but is Byron Murphy, like the question I would ask about defensive tackle, is that a three-down player? Like, is he going to impact the game on three downs? And, and he might. Mm-hmm. He might be a three-down defensive tackle, in, in which case then you add him to what is already, I think, a, a, a decent defensive tackle rotation, starting with one of the best in the league and Chris Jones, and and feel pretty good about it. Like, positional value-wise, gosh, is he the best defensive tackle in the draft? Um, I would say so. Like, hard to argue with the positional value if you think you can get a pass, pass rush presence out of him. I would, I would say he is. Pro Football Focus has him as the best, just ahead of Johnny Newton at Illinois, who I also really, really like a lot. I think Chris Jenkins from Michigan would be a really good piece. Chris Jenkins is a player that if he made it to round two, I would trade up from 64 to go get Chris Jenkins on this team next to Chris Jones. That, to me, would be a really fearsome interior line. And suddenly, long term, I'm feeling great about the defensive line. I would feel awesome about that group going forward if you could add a player like that. So that was the first one. The rest of the draft, though, is what I find really interesting. Second round, Kyrie Jackson, cornerback, Oregon, defensive back to the Chiefs, fine, whatever. Round three, Ben Sinnott, tight end, Kansas State. Round four, Luke McCaffrey, who we talked about yesterday, the wide receiver from Rice. Uh, Tyke Smith, safety from Georgia, fifth round. Offensive tackle from South Dakota State, Garrett Greenfield in the fifth. And Torrey Taylor, punter, Iowa in the seventh. The Chiefs just signed a punter. They're not drafting another one. That would be a shock. So, Ben Sinnott, Luke McCaffrey, if you were able to get a tight end, a future piece at tight end, because you only got Noah Gray for one more year, and to be frank, I have a hard time seeing Noah Gray signing a new contract with the Chiefs. Unless it's one of those one-year type deals like they keep signing Derek Nottie to. Yeah, ag- agree. I do not think he would be a long-term player for the Chiefs, but yes, could come back on a one-year deal. Any interest in a day two tight end? I could be Espe- talk- especially I- if Travis Kelsey is going to have a lighter workload going forward. Yeah, I could be talked into it. I could be talked into it. I don't think like the tight ends were really strong in last year's draft, and I thought that that was a year where the Chiefs could have considered drafting somebody who could really have been Kelsey's apprentice, so to speak. I don't know that that guy's out there in this draft, and certainly I don't think you're drafting a day three guy with the expectation that he's going to be Travis Kelsey, even if Travis Kelsey himself was a third round pick. So 
I don't know. Like they're going to need some depth at that spot. Then again, like we talked about yesterday, they've liked Matt Bushman enough to keep him around for two years. Maybe he's tight end three this next year. What do you think of Sinnott as an NFL prospect? I like him a lot. I like him a whole lot. Do you think he can and be not, a- not just, you know, like mm-hmm. um, I've seen more of his tape because I've watched a lot. You've of watched him in person. Yes, yeah, I've seen him in person. You've gotten to see the all 22 from the press box. Yes. Yes, I have. So I, I, I'm more familiar with Ben Sinnott than I am with any other tight end in the class. Uh, that being said, I really like him. I think he he makes big time catches. He can catch in traffic. He can make plays after the catch. Uh, he's not like huge. He's not out there like Jimmy Graham. You know, he's not mm-hmm. like that kind of big, but he's certainly got good size and great athlete. I, I think he's, I think he's going to be a very good NFL player. I think that's a question the chiefs need to ask is, should we start getting ready for the future? Mm-hmm. Because I mean, there was already rumors that he would hang it up. So they have to get themselves the insurance for themselves with a tight end that can be a great caliber tight end. And, you know, Senate wouldn't be a bad option to draft if you can get them in the second or third round. There just aren't a lot of tight ends historically that have been mega productive at 35 years old, which is what Travis Kelsey yeah. will be this coming season. And I, I still think Travis Kelsey is going to be a good player. Yes, I do. I, but at some point you do have to prepare for that. 2025. I don't, see him getting cut it's maybe 17 million dollars against the salary cap i i feel like it's more likely he gets restructured and kept for sure that year but then he'd be a free agent at age 37 i don't know if you gotta have a plan at some point i would rather have the plan in place they always say the best time to take a quarterback is when you don't need a quarterback because then if you wait until you do you end up in a situation like oh i don't know Commanders. Where they do it every time they have to, and then it doesn't turn out. Or you're the Minnesota Vikings, where this year you might end up with a quarterback room of Sam Darnold and J.J. McCarthy or Bo Nix or Michael Penix, which maybe one of those guys will be good. You don't know, though. Nope. They're not one of the best prospects in the class. You always want to be prepared. And most good teams, Chiefs, Ravens, Packers, Steelers, teams like that, they are prepared for those things. Although the Steelers are a great example of not being prepared when you lose the guy. There's what have they been doing at quarterback since Big Ben retired? Nothing productive. Nope. And Travis Kelsey, with how important he is to the Chiefs, I would put him in that same kind of category. We'll talk some more Chiefs football later on this hour when Jordan Foot of Arrowhead Report joins us to talk some Chiefs football and some Royals baseball. Right now, though, after this commercial break, we've got this week's edition of Random Question Tuesday. That's up next on 5 Sports Talk.
before we start Random Question Tuesday, I want to give a happy birthday shout out to my mom today. Hey, happy birthday. She is happy birthday. currently on vacation in South Carolina with my dad. I have a whole week on the beach. Wonderful. So they what are, a better uh, way to spend your birthday than at the beach. I know. Phone probably buried deep in the sand right now. <laughs> Just enjoying time. Uh, so no, big happy birthday to my mom. All right, Random Question Tuesday here on the show. What is the funniest text screenshot you have on your phone? Screenshot of a text message. What is the funniest one you have? <laughs> okay. Uh, my dad was trying to send like a meme in the family <laughs> group chat. And I don't know how he managed to do this, but he's like trying to like copy and paste a link or something. But all that pasted was memes in all caps with an <laughs> exclamation point and then like 30 lines of a blank space. <laughs> memes. And, and then he said it again, the exact same thing. Was he trying to copy and paste? Or... I, I I have no idea how that happened. <laughs> That's one of those things where I, I didn't even know you could do that. I, I don't leave that much space. I don't have any idea how that happened. Second place is the time that uh, somebody tried to tell me that uh, something made them giggle, but giggle autocorrected to Hitler. <laughs> That's not great. That's not what you want. Would love to know why that was what it was autocorrecting to. <laughs> right. That's a little wow. frightening. Do you have one? Oh, uh, yeah, I got one. Um, so it was when Twitter became X. And uh, my buddy texted me a link from Twitter. And he freaked out and said, OMG, OMFG, I thought I just sent you an bleeping link to porn. <laughs> <laughs> because of the x yeah because it just like the x like it, if it, if you look at it like glance at it, you're like x what <laughs> that's pretty <laughs> like funny. people associate x with that so oh, no i get that when i uh, slightly unrelated um back in the day when my buddies and i used to do backyard wrestling all the time with a title belt and everything we all had wrestling names my one friend who wasn't really into wrestling but did it when we hung out with us um he knew the name triple h from you know wwe tv and she's like, oh, I'm going to be called Triple X. I'm like, nah, I don't think so. I don't think, so. I don't think that's a good idea. I don't think that's what you want. Uh, this question, by the way, my answer, it, thought of it yesterday because of uh, the eclipse. Uh huh. I remembered from the last time we had a major eclipse event when someone texted me, and I have it right in front of me right here, August 21st, 2017. I stared at the sun for a solid four minutes, and I was crying, LMAO. And I said, why did you do that? And she went on to tell me, Sarah's mom told me to go see if it was still happening, and she was wearing glasses, but I wasn't. I can't believe I looked directly into the sun and didn't go blind, so I could become Daredevil. <laughs> How'd that turn out for them? Are they Daredevil now? Uh, not as far as I'm aware. Uh, lost contact. You'll never believe that. All right, Dan, what you got this week? So it's Masters Week, and I believe that tonight is the famed Masters Champions Dinner, when all former champions get together and have dinner together and the year's previous champion selects the menu and pays the tab john mm -hmm. rom's menu this year he actually enlisted celebrity chef jose andres for help it's got a basque influence to it ribeye steak or turbot which is uh, i believe a flatfish uh some really nice puff pastry cake for dessert it's, it's a great looking menu anyway if you guys won the masters what are you serving at the champions dinner I am serving delicacy because you usually serve food that is like from where you're from, right? Y yes. Especially if you're an international winner. Y yes. Lots of international players have done that. Yes. Hideki Matsuyama had a sushi sushi yeah. dinner, right? Uh, I'm doing the, the finest Chicago fair. We're, we're having both deep dish and tavern style pizza, the middle <laughs> wake for us. We're going to have Italian beef, cheese, sport peppers, dipped, of course. And, um, yeah, it's a bunch of greasy food. That, that's what we're eating. I'm also, uh, the key to that is also I'm slowing down my competition. You're going to need a big old greasy meal right before we tee off. Oh, <laughs> buddy. You ain't built for that. I am. I don't know what my meal would be. Uh, it might be. Pepperoni rolls? No. <laughs> might be just a steak. Just keep it simple with a ribeye or yeah. maybe a filet mignon. Yeah. Uh, trying to remember who had filet mignon fairly recently is their choice. 
God, that sounds good. Might have been know. Patrick Reed. Might have been Patrick Reed's yeah, uh, makes sense. dinner was uh, filet mignon. Do you have a favorite cut, by the way? Not not particularly. Do you have a favorite cut of steak? Uh, the filet mignon. All right. Yeah. Hard to beat. Can't go, but can't go wrong with the filet. I'd probably go with like I don't have a uh, like a Denver inspired meal, and I'm not feeding anybody Rocky Mountain oysters. Uh, but uh, no, I go. I'd probably go with like a uh, like a nice like soup and salad combo to start, like a acorn butternut squash soup, maybe mm-hmm. a little like cranberry apple uh, salad, and then go with like some barbecue, like some some choices, like a like a pork, maybe a uh, maybe some ribs, short rib. Maybe a little brisket, a shaved brisket, and uh, a little bit of pulled chicken as well. So we cover all our bases there. Traditional sides like baked beans, mashed potatoes, uh, things like that. And then uh, chocolate, chocolate cake for dessert or peanut butter chocolate cake. That sounds good. I will make me hungry. For the record, uh, former Masters champion Nick Faldo was asked recently what the best and worst Masters dinners were. And he, of course, named his as the best. They one year served fish and chips. Uh, he said the worst was when Bubba Watson took an entire year to decide on chicken breast, mashed potatoes, corn, and mac and cheese. <laughs> he called it Chuck E. Cheese food. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> that sounds like a good meal. Come on. Spencer, what do you have for us? Um, when is the right time? To switch from heat to AC. So everybody has a different answer to this than their domestic partners. I guarantee you. <laughs> That's why I'm asking this question. <laughs> Did you have wanna, this come up this past week? Uh, I mean, kind of. Not yeah. not officially, but I yeah, essentially. Okay. Um, I'm cheap, man. I'm not flipping it until way later than most people. I. I I just I don't I don't need to have AC all the time during the summer like I, or during the late spring like I'll open a window I'll wear shorts yeah, at home I'm I'm okay running a fan uh, if the house yeah. is pretty consistently in like the mid 70s then yeah let's let's get a little cool air circulating through here I'd rather have a hot house than a cold house though See my problem is is I I'm still learning my apartment sure. you know what what it likes to do whenever it's off uh I've turned my heat off because I don't need it, but I turn my AC on for like 30 minutes at a time sometimes. All right. Because the, when I get back in the evening, it's too hot. So then I turn it on because it gets even hotter when I cook food. Because <laughs> yes, it's it so does. small. Yeah. Yeah. I've lived it's that life. It's so Retains small. The heat. It oh, just, yeah. Yeah. Oof, yeah. That's brutal. Coming up next, Jordan Foote from Arrowhead Report will join us here on 580 Sports Talk.
are just 16 days away from the start of the NFL draft. There's really no off season for the NFL these days, is there? So to talk some Chiefs football, we'll get to a little Royals baseball as well. We are now joined by Jordan Foote from Arrowhead Report, part of the SI Fan Nation Vertical. You can find him on Twitter at Foot Noted. That's F O O T E Noted. Also, one of the co hosts of the One Royals Way podcast over at the KC Sports Network. And even though Jordan did not want Cody Rhodes to finish the story this weekend, we wanted to bring him on the show. What's going on, Jordan? How you been, man? I'm good, man. I uh, tweeted on Saturday night that um, Kent Swanson, and I, I kind of used the asterisk to uh, not include his name, that he was going to be insufferable in the group chat, and he sure was. Everyone else was rooting against Cody. He was able to finish the story, but, man, it was a very entertaining night, and my inner child was very excited to see, you know, Taker, Cena, all that good stuff. So still worth it, and uh, glad to be on the other side and moving forward and also chatting some KC Sports with you. I was thoroughly sports entertained this weekend, no doubt about that. Let's get to the Kansas City Chiefs, Jordan, and some of the most recent signings for this team. Number one, bringing Mike Dana back. We were surprised here on this show. Dan and Spencer and I had been talking about it for a while. Surprised he hadn't gotten a deal from someone. Usually this ends up being one-year contract territory part of free agency. And then he ends up signing a multi-year deal to come back with the Chiefs. Looks like it's pretty much two years guaranteed, one tacked on at the end. What do you think about bringing Mike Dana back? I like it. I do think that it was a smart move uh, by the Chiefs. And, man, Brad Spielberger, the article he did on PFF projecting uh, player contracts, he has hit a ton of those. And I believe he was like three for 24 and a quarter with Dana. So he hit the nail on the head um, with that. Very impressive um, work by him. And really the Chiefs, I think it's a good contract. I, I really do like that it's a – multi-year deal for Mike Dana. I fully expected him if he came back to the Chiefs for it to be a one-year prove-it type deal with some incentives that he would hit and then get an opportunity to hit the open market again. This is a guy that's 26 years old. He'll be 27 um, at the, really late in the season. I believe it's early December. Um, so he's not really in kind of that interesting spot, like a luxurious need where you're 26, 27, you have one big chance to cash out um, a one-year deal would have made a lot of sense for him. But to come back to the Chiefs, I do think that for a low-end defensive end two, maybe a high-end um, third guy at that position, perfectly fine contract for a perfectly fine player. Mike Dana has been very consistent. He's been available. He's been healthy. He's coming off the best season of his career. Seems like a great locker room guy. Um, so from a value standpoint, no qualms with it. From a player standpoint, I think the Chiefs were very happy to – not just run it back with guys like Clyde Edwards Alaire, some of the interior defensive linemen. Like this is a very legitimate signing that has a ripple effect. It, it helps the uh, Felix Sanu DK Uzamas of the world, the Malik Herrings of the world not be asked to do too much. And I believe it also will kind of have a little bit of an impact on the entire pass rush as a whole, which is good news for the Chiefs. From a big picture standpoint, and speaking of that pass rush overall, where do you stand, Jordan, on just sort of, well, not even sort of, but just entirely running it back with that defensive line group. Obviously, you had to bring Chris Jones back. That's obvious. You drafted King Felix last year, but new one-year deals for a couple of the guys on the interior in Wharton and in Naughty. You have Amenahu coming back eventually. You bring back Mike Dana. Did it feel like the right approach at the right moment to just bring everybody back from this past season? Yeah, normally I would say that I'm somewhat against the run it back kind of proposal that teams try to do. Um, but the Chiefs are in a very unique situation. This isn't a one-off Super Bowl team. This isn't the first time they've tried to run it back. This is a club that really does value the organizational leadership, the familiarity, the veteran presence. Um, and if they would have lost Chris Jones, obviously this entire plan changes completely. I'm not sure they run it back. They might go a big fish hunting elsewhere, but getting Jones back in the fold, like you mentioned, was a no brainer and a really big deal, literally and figuratively for him, the interior of the defensive line outside of him still doesn't have many impact players. I think Nadi kind of struggled down the stretch last year. Tershawn Morton got a little bit stronger, but still more of a complimentary piece than you have the Neil Farrells, Isaiah Bugs, guys like that as depth. So could they go out in the NFL draft and draft a, 
defensive tackle, nose tackle of the future. I think that's possible, but the defensive end spot, it reminds me of coming into last season. You still don't know too much about FAU. You're getting Charles Amenahu back at some point during the season, not week one, I would assume. Um, with that torn ACL, it's very reminiscent of 2023-24. And we saw, instead of Steve Spagnuolo having to blitz out of necessity, which he did back in, let's say, 2021, 2020, the early part of 2022, he did it because he wanted to, and he could get creative with it, and it helped the back end of the defense a lot. And I think there was a world where if they would have lost both Chris Jones and Legarius Sneed, you're really going to have to blitz out of necessity. Now, the secondary is probably going to be okay. The defense might take a small step back and be maybe a top five, top seven unit instead of the best in the league, but the offense should be better. So I do think that running it back in general might not be the best idea, but for the Chiefs' purposes, it's kind of hard to argue against. Jordan Foote joining us on the Plenty Place Wine and Spirits Hotline, the Renaissance man covering the Chiefs for the Arrowhead Report, the Royals, and the One Row Away podcast. And you can find him on Twitter at Foot Noted. Jordan, more and more, we're starting to see some national experts and mock drafters throw out the suggestion that the Chiefs will go left tackle in round mm. one. How realistic do you think that is? And do you think that's reflective of maybe Wanye Morris not having passed his audition last year when he got to start a couple of games in place of Donovan Smith? Yeah, no, I think that second part, the answer is definitely yes. Um, he made a very good first impression. And I remember for a couple of weeks, people were saying, okay, well, set it and forget it, essentially, with uh, Wanye Morris this year. But then played a little bit more. The sample size got bigger. Really good impact in the run game, I thought, but his pass protection on the left side kind of left a little bit to be desired. Um, not an upgrade over Donovan Smith, I would say. And the, the good thing for the Chiefs is if they want to have a quote-unquote competition, they can literally go out and sign Donovan Smith himself, not just a comparable player, still on the open market. Um, if I recall correctly, he signed pretty late into the offseason last year. It was early to mid-May, um, if I'm not mistaken. So they can go into the NFL draft see what's out there at the position. The problem for them is they're not getting Joe Alt. They're not getting Sashanu. They're not getting Flaga. They're not getting uh, the Washington tackle. Latham probably isn't going to happen. So you're really relying on like an Amarius Mims falling from Georgia or taking a risk on a Jordan Morgan who might be a guard for the Chiefs standards or uh, Kingsley from BYU, more of a second round pick. So they're in an interesting spot of if you're on the clock at 32, you wait for your guy to fall. A, does that happen? B, are you okay maybe getting a little bit rich of a pick? Um, similar to FAU last year. So I wouldn't rule it out by any means. I think that I speak for 99.9% .9 of people that we're still looking at <laughs> the wide receiver spot at 32 and thereabouts. But I definitely do think it's possible that um, they can draft the tackle and that they get some good competition from Wanya Morris. We have seen Brett Veach be aggressive in the draft. We have also seen teams that pick late in the first round be more willing to move backwards a few picks in the draft. Mm -hmm. Given that history, what do you think is more likely? If the Chiefs make a move out of 32, do you think it's more likely that that's up a few spots to get that wide receiver or left tackle? Or do you think it might be down a few spots to let the draft come to them? Yeah, I, I always am going to side with moving up uh, in terms of likelihood. Now, if I'm running it, I might just move back a little bit if I don't like what's up there. But um, the Chiefs, obviously not in Kansas City this year, not feeling the pressure of having to use that first round pick. But I still do think that they would like to get a premier talent or at least as premier as you can get at the end of round one. Um, there are also some NFC teams that – I think could potentially want to deal with Kansas City, maybe a Dallas at 24, Green Bay at 25, Tampa at 26. Um, I believe Arizona is the following pick at 27. Like there's a decent pocket of teams that don't directly compete with the Chiefs. Some of them might view themselves as contenders. Some might not. Maybe you're looking to accumulate some more draft capital. Even Detroit at 29, move up just a couple spots to get a player that you're worried someone will jump you for or take at 30, 31, entirely possible. Could totally see it. 
I think that's in play for a premier wide receiver. I think it's in play for a premier offensive tackle. The the list probably stops there. Um, but I'd far more bet if I was a betting man and, you know, a successful one, unlike what I actually am, that the Chiefs would move up as opposed to uh, dropping back a few spots. We're chatting with Jordan Foote from Arrowhead Report. In fact, he's the deputy editor of Arrowhead Report. Find him at arrowheadreport.com. You can find him on Twitter at footnoted, F-O-O-T-E noted. He joins us here on 5 Sports Talk on the Fleming Place Wine and Spirits Hotline. Jordan, give me a certainty, something in this draft for the Chiefs coming up this year that you think is no doubt for sure going to happen. The one that I think our whole crew has agreed on over the last couple of weeks, there will be a defensive back taken because Brett Veach yeah. might be the best defensive back drafter in the entire NFL. What is the one thing you would point to as a surefire certainty for the Chiefs draft this year? Yep, I've got two. I think number one, like you said, is drafting a defensive back, and I'd, I'd even double down and say that it's a corner. Um, and it could be a day two, day three guy. I would not be surprised at all if the Chiefs sat at 64 and somehow a TJ Tampa from Iowa State, Tyree Jackson from Oregon, that might be a little bit too rich for him. But you go down the list, Renardo Green at Florida State, there are players at every pocket, it seems, Nehemiah Pritchett at Auburn could be an early day three selection for them. Tons of guys. There's a, a Mississippi State kid or two that makes sense. Like the Chiefs value, it seems, the long ranging defensive backs that can get a little bit physical. If you're a little bit stiff in the hips, no big deal. Um, they can convert guys over from safety. The, the combination of familiarity on the coaching staff, the complexity of the playbook but also the versatility of it and then the depth they already have i would bet on them taking a cornerback at some point and bringing them into the fold coaching them up a little bit um, special teams might be a deal breaker there as it is at other positions but could totally see that and then wide receiver i think they take at least one guy i'm not necessarily locked into them taking two because they might add a veteran but at some point in let's say the top 100 picks and they would have three of those to work with i think one of those is wide out now you're not getting a premier player at the top you're probably waiting on let's say an adonai mitchell and xavier worthy lad mcconkey to be there at 32 then in round two and three endless names that we could talk about for probably a good half hour to an hour that all makes sense for the chiefs jordan are you buying lad mcconkey as a late first round pick I do, and it's kind of iffy because I think simultaneously he's never going to be the best receiver on an NFL team. So you're like, why the heck would you take that guy at 32? But I believe he's going to be like the second best receiver on an NFL team for, let's say, 10 years. I just buy the route running chops. I think he's a good athlete. The size wasn't as alarming as I thought it would be during the pre-draft process. So he has some questions to answer in terms of going out of his frame for the catch radius and being competitive at the catch point. He's not going to be the X style receiver where he can line up along the line of scrimmage, but I buy the chops. I buy the pure receiver ability. And I think that even with looking at the box score and seeing that he wasn't available all the time, he didn't produce the most that if it's the chiefs taking him at 32, um, I wouldn't bat any eyes at that pick. Jordan, we'd be remiss if we did not ask you a Royals question or two while we had you, as you are part of the one Royal way podcast podcast, through. Royals are six and four going into the start of a series with the Astros tonight at the K through the first 10 games. What is the development for the Royals, the positive development that you are most convinced can last throughout the season? Oh man, I did not know where you were going to go with that last part because I would have said the starting rotation, but man, having the lowest whip in baseball at 0.81 um, throughout the whole year, probably not the most sustainable, but I'll tell you what, two things that jumped out at me, and I was reading an article from uh, Pete Gradoff at the, the Kansas City Star that outlined both of these stats. Their first in defensive run saved above average. I think that's entirely in play throughout the whole year um, with an infield of Bobby Wood Jr., Michael Garcia, Vinny Pascantino is an underrated, I would say, defender. Um, the outfield seems to be holding steady if not improved a little bit and then also i think the power is going to be here to stay like if michael garcia is able to continue elevating the ball and show off a little bit of pop in his bat salvador perez bobby witt jr nelson velasquez like the royals have 
several bats and even a few that are underwhelming. They haven't got much out of Pasquantino. Nick Lofton hasn't played much or produced much. I do think that Hunter Renfro will improve uh, throughout the course of the season because he's not going anywhere. The power might be here to stay. Now, the on-base stuff, um, the WRC+, plus, the rankings and certain things will probably fluctuate, but I would bet on the defense and the power, uh, both being two of the the better numbers in baseball. Definitely the defense, but I do think that the Royals might uh, just break that franchise record for home runs. Jordan, I was as hard on MJ Melendez as anyone a year ago. Yep. And and frankly, I think a lot of it was deserved, but he has been remarkable to start this season. Are you buying that this is a new and improved or not even new and improved, but an MJ Melendez that is actually getting to that ceiling? Do you think that is here to stay for him? I'll tell you what, man. We did a show a couple of weeks ago. It was right before the start of the regular season. And we had an award, or I guess the opposite. It was a superlative for most likely to fall short of expectations. And my pick was MJ Melendez. Uh, I was like, I just don't think that the improvements uh, last season were legitimate, but he has been on an absolute tear, like you said. And in the second half of last year, he slashed 273, 352, 485. Like he was legitimately one of the best bats, if not, you know, probably the, the second best bat, I'd say on the team in that second half. 124 WRC plus he was walking well he was striking out a little bit less um, if the defense can improve to just close to league average it doesn't even have to be right at league average it doesn't have to be good he can be a two or three win player and I don't know if he's going to be a necessary like star for the team but on a Royals club if they have one clear superstar in Bobby Wood Jr. and then several good players in Melendez, Pasquantino, Michael Garcia, the rotation comes along. You can really see a core starting to take shape. So I'm not quite buying into it yet. He still needs to uh, sustain it. We're only a couple weeks into the season, but I'm definitely keeping an eye on it. And I'll be the first to admit I was wrong if he can keep this up. For more of Jordan's takes on the Kansas City Royals, go check out the One Royal Way podcast, part of the Kansas City Sports Network. And for the Chiefs, go check out arrowheadreport.com, where Jordan is the deputy editor. He joins us as often as we can get him on here on the Fleming Place Wine and Spirits Hotline on 580 Sports Talk. And make sure you find him on Twitter as well, where his handle is at footnoted. Jordan, my man, we always appreciate the time. Thank you so much, and uh, enjoy the start of the Astro Series coming up tonight. Yep, thanks a lot, guys. That is Jordan Foote from Arrowhead Report joining us here on 580 Sports Talk. We'll talk a lot of KU basketball next hour with Michael Swain. We've got some Royals baseball to continue on with, plus what is wrong with you. That is all coming up when we get to the 4 o'clock hour of 580 Sports Talk.
now, 4 o'clock hour of 580 Sports Talk going up on a Tuesday. Brendan Dorzinski, Dan Lucero, and Spencer Dupuy here with you today. We're off at 6. Normal length show today. Royals baseball comes up tonight. Royals versus Astros. No Framber Valdez. Got scratched for this series. Was supposed to start for the Astros. He's banged up, though. So it'll be Cole Reagans versus Christian Javier. Royals and Astros tonight. You'll be able to hear that whole game plus pre and post right here on 580 WIBW. Here at the 4 o'clock hour of the show, Michael Swain will join us. We'll talk some Royals baseball. We've got today's What Is Wrong With You. We'd love to hear from you on the Top City Metal Supply text line as well. 785-272-9429 is our text line number. No more wasting money on metal pieces that leave you with unnecessary leftovers because Top City Metal Supply will cut exact lengths of aluminum, steel, and stainless steel tailored to your project's specifications. Start optimizing your budget with Top City Metal Supply on South Topeka Boulevard, just north of Forbes Field. You can also find us and let us know your thoughts on anything we're talking about on the show today on YouTube. 580 Sports Talk is the name of our YouTube channel and, of course, of the show, which you can find just by searching 580 Sports Talk on YouTube. You can also find the video stream on our website, 580WIBW.com. We'll also have some Royals tickets to give away a little bit later on this hour. And before we get to the boys in blue, it is time for the four o'clock hour keyword for Alpha Media's Choose Your Trip contest. You can enter this right now at 580wibw.com. All you need to do is enter this keyword. It is only active for the four o'clock hour. At five o'clock, no more, no mas. This keyword will not work anymore. So you need to enter this keyword between now and five. Your four o'clock hour keyword is. Repost. R-E-P-O-S-T. Repost. So go over to 580-WIBW.com. Enter repost. If you click on the Choose Your Trip contest, and you will be entered to win a trip, exactly that, of your choice to anywhere, including airfare, hotel, and all that jazz. Back in the day, we would have said retweet, not repost, but that's fine. I still say retweet. I do too. I, I, I do as well. Abby just said that to me last night. I was cleaning up, uh, cleaning up dinner. And then I had turned the water off and I was eating a, a cookie over the sink and it had been quiet. She says, what are you doing? And I said, oh, I'm just eating a cookie and scrolling Twitter now. She goes, isn't it funny how no one ever stopped calling it Twitter? And I said, yes, it is very funny, actually. <laughs> it's extremely funny uh, at the expense of one particular man uh, more than anyone else. <laughs> the Royals versus the Astros, again, coming up a little bit later on tonight. 641st pitch, 6 o'clock pregame. Royals made a new signing yesterday. Zach Davies, a major league veteran. Did you see if this is a minor league deal or a... I it am, is a minor league yes, deal. Yes, certainly is a minor league deal. So he is being sent to AAA Omaha. Would not be entirely surprised if Davies at some point gets a call up to the major league club. He's been a starter his entire career. 200 games played, 200 games started for Zach Davies. Career ERA, which sits at 436. Peripherals are right around that same number. Um He's fine. He's a body. You do wonder, and I saw some Royals folks uh, opine about this on Twitter yesterday after the signing was reported. Maybe the Royals try to convert him into a bullpen arm. I don't know if that's something they're going to want to do. He broke in pretty young. He was 22 when he broke in back in 2015. Uh, was with the Diamondbacks the last two years. Spent most of his career with Milwaukee, with stops in San Diego, Chicago, and again, Arizona as well. He tried to make the Nats roster. Was that this summer or this, this spring? This spring. And didn't and make it. He didn't make it. He got released on March 22nd. Okay. Well, that's interesting to note. So, because at that point, he wasn't, he didn't want a minor league deal. Because they were open to bringing him back on a minor league deal. I remember seeing and he didn't want it. I, I assume then he, three weeks ago, he has realized since that, then that, that's, yeah, yeah. That, ha that happens a lot with players, veteran guys like Davies, who they come into, they come in as non roster guys or minor league deal guys in this spring training. And if, if it looks like they're not going to make the team, what the the big club will do, they'll probably do, they'll do them a solid, maybe cut them with a week left in spring training, give yep. them a chance to latch on somewhere if that's not what they want to do. But yeah, not, nothing forthcoming for Zach Davies. Two possible reasons for that. First, uh, 
some unsavory details uh, regarding his personal life are out there. Uh, apparently not a great husband. Um, and Ex-husband. He's he, divorced now. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, if not, you know the story, you know why. Yeah. yeah that very unsurprising conclusion to uh, some of the details that were put out there by the former Mrs. Davies. Uh, also, the fact that while seven is a really good number to roll in craps, uh, it is not a good ERA to have. And that was his ERA in 18 starts and 82 and a third innings last year. Now, the peripheral numbers suggest that he was pretty unlucky to have an ERA that high. But a seven ERA, and I'm, I mean seven even, is a seven even earned run average. And so you're talking about a guy who was never overpowering even his best. His career high for strikeouts per nine is 8.2. That was back in the in the COVID year. Uh, with San Diego in 2020. Never a great command guy the last three years, a little bit homer prone. This is probably a guy who is a fringe major league starter at this point, and teams have treated him accordingly uh, this offseason and now in the, as this season has begun. But one thing we were talking about when this season began was the relative lack of organizational depth for the Royals in terms of their starting pitching that they've got the five guys they've got in their rotation right now, all of whom are off to terrific starts, but it's really rare to just roll the same five guys as starting pitchers all year long. Most teams don't do that. So you need a sixth starter and probably a seventh and an eighth and a ninth and a 10th. And usually those are guys who come up from the minors or maybe it's your long guy. Like, Jordan Lyles is probably starter number six. Like if Michael Waka stubbed his toe the day before his next start and he couldn't go, it would be Jordan Lyles. Um, the AAA starting pitching depth for the Royals, I'm pulling up their uh, Omaha roster right now. Um, it's not really fair to look at numbers. The The Storm Chase actually have a pretty good team ERA early on at 4.09. Um, but, uh, you know, AAA numbers, ERA numbers are typically pretty inflated. But uh, your starters down there right now are Daniel Lynch, who's probably starter number seven. And then after that, you have Andrew Hoffman, who's a non-prospect at age 24. Luis Sessa, who's 32, and he's kicked around the big leagues. Jonathan Bolin, who was at one time a prospect of some renown uh, for the Royals, but now he's 27. Uh, and Anthony Veneziano, who we saw debut late last year. Fulton's guy. Yeah, they have Fulton driving the Anthony Veneziano hype train. I say that, I bring that up to show that if the Royals had an injury crisis, they'd be leaning on a lot of guys who are pretty unproven and also Jordan Lyles. And you would like to have some other options. So I think bringing Zach Davies in as a AAA arm, soak up some innings at AAA and keep you from having to expose a Veneziano or a Bolin to the big league crucible uh, for a couple of weeks in the event of a, of a long-term injury to one of the starters for the Royals is probably the best thing to do. You've got to have more than se- like right now. I think if you're the Royals, you feel, you feel great about the way your first five has started. Yeah. You, you know that Jordan Lyles is there. Mm-hmm. You don't feel great about that, but you know, he's there. He's in, at the big league level. He started games at the big league level. He's going to go out there and do what he does. And you feel pretty good about having Daniel Lynch in reserve. His first two starts in the minors have been fine. Uh, maybe a little bit hit unlucky and not missing any bats, but he's been fine, a 4-5 ERA. After that, you've got questions. Yep. And again, you're going to need more than seven starting pitchers to get through the season. So I, I don't mind this. There's no such thing as a bad minor league deal. And I think for a Royals team that may have to dip into some starting pitching depth because, I mean, have you heard the news? Have you followed Major League Baseball injury news, pitcher news lately? You can never have too many guys with big league experience in your organization. Yeah, I I get it. I understand it. And the other thing, too, that that suggests to me is I think last year they would have been fine to say, okay, we've had two starters hit the injured list. Uh, let's give Veneziano a month, a, a month of starts mm-hmm. to see, see what happens. I think this year already the Royals 10 games in and, and given their activity in the offseason have decided – now we're going to make a go of this. We're 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 not going to. This is not a year where we're just going to throw our hands up and evaluate young guys that we don't think might be completely ready, and we're going to throw them into the fire. We want to have some big league guys on hand 
some guys who've gotten major league hitters out if we've got to plug somebody in for two to three weeks. They're more comfortable doing that with a with a Luis Sessa or a Zach Davies than they are with a Veneziano or a Bolin. Something else that I thought was interesting that I saw today, this is from farmtofountains.com, which is mostly about prospects, but it's about Michael Garcia. Kevin O'Brien wrote this over at Farm to Fountains. It's an interesting piece about Michael Garcia and what he has been able to do that has led to this increase in pop and power at the plate so far. And Jordan Foote was talking to us about this a little bit ago when we talked to him at the end of the three o'clock hour and why he has been able to hit with more power. And the launch angle is the obvious thing here, because if you're, you're swinging a flat bat and you're hitting it really hard, well, that's good. It's, you know, if, if you've ever taken a, a physics class, you know how that is eventually going to end and it's going to hit the ground and it's not going to get over the wall and it's going to be closer to fielders, all of those things. Well, now he's been able to hit it a little bit higher into the air. But something else that uh, O'Brien writes about here at Farm to Fountains, he's pulling the ball a little bit more. And the sample size is minuscule. I understand that's always the caveat you have to add at this part part of the season. But it's significant. Because it's working. He's already got three home runs. He had four in, what was it, 132 games last season. It's working. He is able to drive the ball a little bit more. He's, and according to this piece, already 2% higher pull rate than a year ago. So by trying to get out in front and trying intentionally to pull the ball a little bit more instead of being a slap spraying singles hitter, which is effective. I mean, that's a useful piece to have. But it's not as valuable and not as efficient in terms of scoring runs and producing as being able to hit doubles and triples and home runs. And that has been the big difference for Michael Garcia. And that made me think, like, big picture. We talked yesterday about how the Royals, like, it feels different. The the power is back. The vibes are back for this Royals team. Things feel good. They feel exciting. There's a little bit, and maybe if you're a really scorned Royals fan, you don't feel this way. But at least to me, it feels like there's a little bit less Oh, uh, yeah, but what happens next week when they lose, you know, six in a row? Then it's going to suck. I feel like there's a little bit less of that this year, and there's actually some, maybe some of this will continue. I mean, these, these guys are fun to watch. It's a fun team. The young guys are very exciting to watch play baseball. It feels like things are more intentional now with this team. And I think that's really important, especially with a younger team. And it's not just the hitters. Bobby, or I'm sorry, Brady Singer as well with the pitching staff. Uh, Annie Rogers from MLB.com, she wrote a piece where she talked to Brian Sweeney, Royals pitching coach, and talked to him about some of the positives he's seen from the staff this year. And some of it was about Brady Singer and his pitch mix and that he's now working in a four-seam fastball more often. And he's going to the sweeper a little bit more often. And it is paying off. It is showing results. And has that not been the biggest issue for Brady Singer his entire career is using more than two pitches? because. if you can only use two pitches, you know what you are? A reliever. You're you're a closer. That's what you are if you only have a two-pitch mix. But if he's going to go to even three, let alone occasionally sprinkling in a fourth, that makes you so much more dangerous on the mound. What has Brady Singer been so far this year? Awesome on the mound. Really good, yeah. To the point where in their power rankings this week over at The Athletic, they did an early season, first week of the year overreaction for every team. The overreaction for the Royals was their ace is at, or their Cy Young candidate is not Cole Reagans or Michael Walker. It's actually Brady Singer. <laughs> that's how good he has been. And that's not nothing. The fact that intentionally and with direction and with guidance, he has been able to do that. Now he's got to keep it up. That's where the small sample size thing comes in because we saw outings in 22. We saw outings last year. We saw him as far back as 21, where for a couple games, you would see the change up get thrown a little bit more, but then it would go away. And it's well, well, what happened here? It's got to be continuous. It's got to be committed. But I think the fact that we're seeing a lot of this, the tweaked approach for MJ Melendez, the intentional directive to pull the ball a little bit more for Michael Garcia, the tweak to the pitch mix for Brady Singer. These are intentional changes. And I think, and you can tell me if I'm wrong, Dan, but long time like there was a goal in mind in terms of roster and farm building which clearly didn't really work but it sort of felt like during games 
and this isn't all Mike Matheny's fault. It is in part, but not entirely. So we're like, what are we doing here? Like, well, what is the goal? Like when you have your nine guys who all in a row go up to bat, what is the goal? Individually, as a team, what are you trying to accomplish? Your pitching staff, what are you trying to be as a staff? Because I'm sure the answer is not guys who can't hit the zone. Now the Royals are doing that. Now individuals have made those changes to try to improve their game or to add pop, take to the next level, whatever. That is A, awesome and great. And I think something the Royals have been missing. And B, it's why you can't grade Matt Quattrero's first year with the Royals. That was to me the, the college football year zero. That was Lance Leipold in 2022. He's working with a crappy roster that was built by a guy who got fired, who was no longer there. You have to figure out what you have. You're just trying to get through that first year and get your plan into place. This is, I think, when you start grading Quattrero, his staff, the development, J.J. Piccolo as well. Positive start. It was an evaluation year last year. Instead of coming in and saying, we're going to fix everything, we're going to give you all of this instruction and, and completely change who you are as a hitter or who you are as a pitcher. We're going to get you in and see what you are as a hitter and see what you are as a pitcher. And, and any tweaks you make are kind of on the, on the light or less invasive side. Cause you don't want guys to go to the plate with a hundred different swings thoughts or go to the mound with a hundred different mechanical or, or pitch mix thoughts. You, you want to let them grow because we're still talking about young players, relatively speaking, uh, when we talk about Singer, Garcia, Melendez, Witt, like all these guys, it was absolutely last year an evaluation year because you don't bring in a manager from Tampa Bay and a pitching coach from Cleveland. Franchises that are well known for developing players, getting the most out of their players, being more analytically minded than the Royals have been over time. You don't bring those people in and not have the long-term intent to be to be able to make changes, mm. to make the Royals more like Tampa Bay and more like Cleveland in regards to how things are taught, how changes are made, how information is conveyed to players, and what information is conveyed to players. So if you look at last year like an evaluation season, a year zero for the Royals, which I think is a good way to put it, a lot of what has happened throughout spring training, and now these first 10 games of the regular season, starts to make a little more sense as, like you said, being intentional, something that was planned out. And you've got guys early on really reaping the benefits of some real necessary changes. And, like, I don't know how relevatory it is. I don't know how how much of a brain genius you have to be to go to Michael Garcia and say, Hey, you hit the ball hard, but you never hit it in the air. Could you consider hitting it in the air? Maybe you'll like the results. Like, I don't think, like, I I, I, I picked that out, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I, me and baseball savant in 15 minutes. And I said, hey, it would be sure would be something if Michael Garcia hit the ball in the air. It's one thing to see that. It's one thing to see the data. It's another thing to be able to present that data to the player and work on the biomechanical changes that you need to be able to make sure that you're doing that, you're doing that effectively, and you're doing that in a way that is comfortable. So, that's why this six and four start and some of the statistics that are being put up by some of these younger Royals players, I think is more encouraging than it otherwise would be divorced from the context. It's you had to figure out something. You had to be able to unlock some of these guys and the potential. And the reason why a bunch of baseball nerd writers, and I mean that lovingly, were so invested in seeing what Michael Garcia could do this year and wanting to see this pitching staff. And could Brady Singer finally figure it out for a full season? All of those things. If this staff can get them there, this Royals team is, is so much better. You've got to avoid the bad habits. Again, I think about Brady Singer more than anyone when I think about that. But if Michael Garcia is hitting doubles and home runs instead of just spraying singles all over, if you're getting better pitching consistently from Brady Singer, this team is going to reach the goals, the loftier end of goals that it set for itself this year. You just have to be consistent with it. We'll talk some KU basketball coming up later on this hour when Michael Swain joins us from Fog.net for this week's edition of Jayhawk Weekly. First, though, after this commercial break, today's What is Wrong With You? Two new stories going head-to-head. They're coming up next here on 5 Sports Talk.
What is wrong with your time here on 580 Sports Talk? Brendan, Dan, and Spencer joining you here on the show. Our winner from yesterday on What is Wrong With You? The woman who was shoplifting at a Walmart and told police that she was actually playing a game called 21. 21 what? Great question. Have absolutely no idea. But she stole over $1,000 worth of merchandise, put it in her boyfriend's car, and then they took it all out and then also found drugs in the car and platinum bars in a safe in the car. That just platinum. She had uh, like silver and copper, I think. Yeah, she's freaking Yukon Cornelius over here. <laughs> Got silver and gold out the wazoo in her car. <laughs> Why? You never want to be caught with a locked safe in your car. Like, that's not going to end well for you. I'm I'm pretty confident in that. So that was our winner from yesterday. I'm going to go first today, where we meet a man who is hiding out in a garbage can. Arguing that he was not subject to arrest, a Florida man told police that he was, quote, allowed to be drunk and disorderly and to sit naked in a trash can on a public sidewalk. <laughs> St. Petersburg, Florida police alleged that Wiley James Weeks Wiley spelled W-Y-L-Y, by the way. Special what is wrong with you? That man's parents. 35 years old. He was intoxicated, unsteady on his feet, and smelled of booze when they discovered him late Saturday evening on a downtown street. Weeks was extricated, sans clothes, from a corner trash can and was arrested for disorderly intoxication and resisting an officer without violence, both of which are misdemeanors. In addition to claiming that he could not be punished for his take on Oscar the Grouch, Weeks said he did not have to provide officers with his name or demographics. Those are his words. Weeks yesterday pleaded guilty to both counts and was fined $520. He has multiple other charges in his past for theft, disorderly conduct, panhandling, criminal mischief, and other misdemeanor convictions. One of his prior arrests came after he and a friend were spotted drunk and naked in a Tampa after leaving a bar. They told police they thought it would be funny to strip themselves of their clothes. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, got drunk and took off his clothes and sat in a trash can. After once before, getting drunk, taking off his clothes, and not getting in a trash can. He thought he could. Like, he really I, seemed to think that that was totally fine. And, look, I understand. We do a lot of Florida stories. And uh, it does sometimes seem like there are no laws in the state of Florida. I do really like that he just said... I'm not subject to arrest. <laughs> I'm not going to give you my demographics. Yeah, my demographics. My demographics. That's really funny. Well, we thought he was a white male, but now we just don't know. He won't tell us. <laughs> I, we can't know for sure. I ain't got to give you my demographics. <laughs> yeah, what? Well, I'm in the 18 to 49 male <laughs> demographic. <laughs> so, yeah, he uh, sitting in a trash can. <laughs> You can't arrest me. The cops hit him with that. I think you should leave. I don't think you're allowed to do that. <laughs> I mean, what, what are they going to attack on resisting arrest onto it? If I just say no, <laughs> what could hurt? What could hurt? All right, Dan, what do you have? All right. We're going to my home state of Colorado, where a Jefferson County district judge has sentenced Joseph Tyler to eight years in prison and ordered him to pay $23,000 in restitution to older Coloradans that he defrauded in a tree trimming scam nope. that lasted two and a half years. He Fraud! It is another scam story. Uh, he pled guilty to theft targeting at-risk victims, which is a class three felony, Ew. and also to just theft, a class five felony. Mm. He and his wife were both indicted on 51 counts Whoa. for using deceptive tactics to commit financial fraud on vulnerable older Coloradans, including many who are over 80 years old oh. in Adams, Arapahoe, Denver, El Paso, Jefferson, and Otero counties. Arapahoe County is where I grew up. Uh, Amelia Tyler cooperated with prosecutors. She was sentenced in January, served a year in Jefferson County Jail, and is currently on probation. So this was their grand scam. The husband-wife team would show up at a residence to solicit tree trimming or home repair services for a set amount of money. Sometimes the homeowner paid in cash, but more often they paid it by check. Most importantly, they paid up front. The wife would then cash the check at the homeowner's bank while the husband cut a few branches. After cashing the check, the wife would return to pick up the husband before he completed most of the job. The defendants would then tell the homeowner that they needed to get something and would be back. You guessed it. They never came back. At least 50 individuals were victims of the tree trimming scam. 
I hope they go to jail forever. Until our society completely collapses, I hope they are sitting in jail. Scamming old people is lower than low. It's just sick. Yeah, the, 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 this is some of the all-time worst behavior that we've spotlighted. Like, truly, truly awful, disgusting behavior that we have uh, we have brought to light here on what is wrong with you. Scamming the elderly. And Get that, out of my face. Not even a good scam. Yeah. Like, not even, like, a thoughtful scam. Just, oops, we forgot something. Be right back. And then running away from it. That sucks. I hate these people. Um... Man, I'm going to go with the guy who got drunk and sat in a trash can yeah, and took lot, off his clothes. Isn't that much more fun? Much more fun. In fact, I'm going to give that guy the nod over uh, the shoplifter. Really? Okay. All right. Spencer, who you got? Uh, I got the garbage guy today for today's. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think he gets the nod over. The Walmart lady. Let me state my case. She was playing a game. This guy's a <laughs> career guy that does dumb game. stuff. Yeah. Like, this guy does dumb stuff, and he's been charged for it before. He was also drunk. He thought you were allowed to be <laughs> drunk, though. It's fine. I can sit in this trash can without my clothes on. It's fine. I have diplomatic immunity, which, hey, it's Florida. He might. I mean, you might as well claim sovereign citizenship, right? I mean, <laughs> That's the next step. Yeah, might as well try it. Uh, I'm going to say our reigning champion gets the win again. This I'm going to go with Ty goes to sobriety, essentially. Now, this woman sure. might not have been totally sober. She, she didn't have drugs in, in her car. car. Yeah. I, I'm just still so puzzled. This other one is very straightforward. I'm so puzzled by the platinum and gold and silver and why she thought it was a fine game to steal things. <laughs> that one leaves me with more questions. I'm going to go with that one as our deciding vote. It remains our weekly winner in What is Wrong With You. Michael Swain will join us next for Jayhawk Weekly. But before we get there, we've got some Royals tickets to give away. 785-272-9429. Caller 2. You've got two tickets, or you've got four tickets, a family four-pack from the Deep Esquale Moore Injury Attorney's Ticket Window. 785-272-9429. Those tickets are yours. Caller number two, Michael Swain, joins us next on 580 Sports Talk. Give a shout out to Sam, who is the winner of our Royals family four pack of tickets. Thanks to our friends at Deepest Quality Moore Injury Attorneys. 
You can find their office at 534 South Kansas Avenue here in the capital city. Also some drama in uh, the YouTube comments over my deciding vote. Uh, Trevor says, no way drunk Oscar the Grouch just lost a Walmart lady. And what is wrong with you? <laughs> Sorry. Hey, Trevor, I'm with you. Hey, both good stories. Both good stories, but there can only be one. There is only one Michael Swain, and he now joins us on the Fleming Place Wine and Spirits Hotline. He covers the Kansas Jayhawks for Fog.net and 24-7 Sports. You can find him on Twitter at mswain 24 7 Michael, uh, what was your level of surprise that UConn not only won, but blasted Purdue last night? Um, not super surprised. Look, UConn is kind of, it's been a juggernaut, honestly. And I think, at least for me, watching the game last night, the first few minutes, you, you know, I kind of thought, okay, hey, Purdue's kind of in this. They're playing well. And then it became abundantly clear that basically UConn said, okay, nobody on Purdue is going to shoot any threes all game. And as we, as KU fans know this year, if you don't shoot a lot of threes, it's really hard to win basketball games against really good teams. So, I wasn't really surprised by the end result. And, and this UConn team, man, they are so good. I, it's kind of like in a boxing match where, like, guys just lean on you. And they just can't continue to lean on their opponents until they break. And I don't think anyone has the ability to withstand that. And so I think that's what you end up seeing, and, and Purdue goes down. So not super surprised, man. UConn's just been so good this year and deserved back-to-back champions. Am I going to claim a transitive national championship? Yes, I am, because KU beat UConn <laughs> this year. So I am going to claim that. Hang the banner. Put it up in Allen Fieldhouse. As for the Kansas Jayhawks, Michael, the big overarching question for this offseason is, what's next? What is the next thing that this coaching staff, that this team is going to try to accomplish in the portal, or or potentially when it comes to high school recruiting as well? Yeah, well, you know, I think the first week of the portal for KU is kind of a, a bunch of dopamine hits for, for fans, right? KU lands Riley Kugel and then lands Zeke Mayo in the span of, what, 24 hours? And now things are going to slow down. You know, KU, I think, in the end is going to have two scholarship spots to work with. And it sounds like kind of wing slash guards are going to be the priority for KU. And so it's going to take time, right? You got to remember that there are guys going through the NBA draft that KU could show interest in, right? AJ Store from Wisconsin is a guy that I think has had public um, or KU's had public interest in him and he's going through the NBA draft process and I, there are going to be guys like that, right? They're going to take slower um, times, right? Kevin McCullough didn't commit to KU until what, May, I, I, I want to say. So I think there's going to be a little bit of a lull here while some of these NBA guys figure out what they're going to do and also while guys still decide if they're going to go in the portal. That's the crazy part is it feels like it's been a a mad dash to the portal. And yet, you know, we're kind of still got a couple more weeks to go before it shuts. So the pool is not solid yet. The, um, the pool of guys coming back from the NBA is not solid at all. So it's kind of (laughs) the first stage of the portal, I think is kind of done for Kate where they've got two really good commits. And now it's going to be about finding the right pieces to fill out this puzzle of the roster for next season. Okay. So with, what is, you know, what the expectation that there will be a couple of roster spots to play with here? We still have to find out who, if anyone else, is going to go into the portal. I think of El Marco Jackson. I think maybe of Jamari McDowell. I would like to see McDowell come back, but but who knows? I'm, I'm not in practice every single day. I have no idea what Bill Self and company think of him. I have been under the assumptions that Clements would leave, but the fact that we haven't heard anything yet makes me think, well, maybe that's not the case. What are the things that these guys are going to have to work out with the coaching staff to determine whether or not their best chance to play is at KU or if they should go elsewhere? Well, so there's a lot of conversations happening. I don't think it's just one solid conversation that happens and then a decision is made and that's it, right? This is very different than last year where a lot of those decisions were super mutual, right? Like Joe Yesfu wanted to go play somewhere. Bobby Pettiford wanted to go play somewhere. And same thing with eventually kind of Kyle Cuff is the one that there were a lot of discussions about. And so I think this this kind of group of players, right, and the decisions they have to make, I think these are conversations that they have kind of continuously with the coaching staff on what they're feeling. It's going to come down to, I think, role at KU. Some guys are um, – Happy being, you know, Mitch Lightfoot's a really good example, right? Someone that knew he was never going to start at Kansas and be a 25-minute-per-game guy, but loved Kansas, loved the role he could offer, and the coaching staff was fine with him being in that role. And I think last offseason has probably, I don't want to say scarred, but I think probably um, drawn people probably to the wrong direction of things, where 
if a guy's not going to play, he's going to transfer. I think there is still space for guys in college basketball to know their role and be happy being at Kansas and not necessarily being someone that's going to, you know, go and play 25 to 30 minutes a game. And I think Zach Clements is probably one that fits that. It's probably why people should sign up for VIP. I'll plug that. You know, that's something we've been telling for almost a week now that there's a good chance Zach Clements does come back. Um, because look, going trying to get in a third big man in the portal, you know, you're going to end up with another guy at the level of Parker Brown. And at that point, you may as well have the continuity of Zach Clements coming back and instead of trying to add a new transfer to the fold. So, you know, you look at all these things and so much of it is fluid, right? Guys can change their mind. They can wake up one day and say, nope, I'm ready to go. And that's the thing about the portal. Guys can wake up, make a decision and be in the portal six hours later. So it's, you can't ever say things are solid and 100% clear, but I think there are, those are some of the things that guys have to weigh, and I'll be really interested to see how it plays out because, again, right now I don't think anything's super finalized. Our guest is Michael Swain of Fog.net, part of the 24-7 Sports Network, joining us here on the Fleming Place Wine and Spirits Hotline for Jayhawk Weekly on 580 Sports Talk because he does every Tuesday at this time. You can follow Michael on Twitter at mswain247. If you had to put a number on it, a percentage-wise, how confident are you that the starting five for next year's Kansas men's basketball team is already known to be on the roster for next year? Um, no, I, I probably zero out of 10. Um, I, I don't think Johnny Furphy is going to be back. And I think the wing player that's going to start for KU has not been added yet. And I think that is going to be the big question here over the next couple weeks or a couple months, depending on how long this takes is going to be that that role, right? Who's going to be the guy that comes in and plays kind of whatever you want to call it, right? The, the, the two or the three, it's really a three. And I think that really is going to be the question because we know DeWan Harris is going to start. We know KJ Adams is going to start regardless of what fans want to believe. And then Hunter Dickinson is likely going back to KU. So you've got kind of your core there, and then it's going to, going to come down to, okay, Zeke Mayo, Riley Kugel, who wins that out? Or maybe if Kansas goes and gets another elite guard which one of those three wins that job and then who's kind of that wing that kansas gets that can kind of play the the three so i think there's plenty of stuff to be decided i think he's off to a good start but i think generally you know who is going to be kind of the main three starters right now it's about kind of filling out the rest of that starting lineup over the next two months is the suggestion then that riley kugel may not start i you know i i Look, guys, I'm not going to guarantee anything at this point. If Riley Kugel comes in and is better than Zeke Mayo, Riley Kugel will start. And if Zeke Mayo is better than Riley Kugel, then he will start. And if both of those guys are better than the other wing that KU brings in, those two will start. Uh, you know, I, I love that, you know, Bill Self, I think at the end of the season, was starting to say, oh, we want eight, nine starters. And then if this happens all the time on the message board too, right? First question I get, is he going to start? Well, didn't we just hear Bill Self, right, spend the last, kind of what three weeks of the season saying he wants to get away from having really five guys that play and a couple bench guys so i think it's one of these situations where if riley kugel is coming off the bench for ku that's pretty great and if zeke bayo is coming off the bench for ku that's pretty great too so i think ku is in, in a good position it really doesn't matter who starts it. again i'll use the bill self cliche it's about who finishes games to shift gears a bit here to uh, to football and recruiting, mm-hmm. we had a listener wanted to know about this. Typically, when we think about Kansas football and their recruiting efforts in the state of Kansas, that they've typically in recent years lagged behind Kansas State, particularly when it comes to some of the Western Kansas or the smaller town, if you will, Kansas mm-hmm. prospects. They've lagged behind Kansas State in that department. But KU was first in the door with a Division One offer for Axtell's Brandon, I believe it's Schmelzley, or, uh, yeah, Schmelzley, uh, and mm-hmm. the first to offer him uh, last week. What do you know about that recruiting process, and how is, is is that indicative maybe of more of an effort from Lance Leipold and the staff to get in first with some of those prospects from outside the, the major cities where Kansas has done most of its recruiting yeah. football-wise? Yeah, you know, guys, we could probably do a show on on local recruiting Kansas football. You know, I think KU has been the first to offer kids, and it's not maybe been to the same degree. But look, I think if you talk to K State people, they'll say they're they're slow on people. I think the thing that has limited Kansas is not being very good at football for 15 years, and this generation right now, the guys that are you know 16, 17, they don't know what it looks like 
for Kansas to be consistently good at football. What they know is K-State's really good at football consistently. And it's having to change that over time, where it really is generations of kids that have watched KU be really bad and incompetent. And you're having to change that mindset. So for someone like Schmelzi, you know, he, he's someone that is playing eight-man football. You watch the tape. He looks like someone that's probably going to play defense, likely safety or linebacker. And it's an athlete offer. So KU, at least from what I've heard, is going to have him come out to camp in the summertime. They're going to work him out a couple positions and then make a decision on the position that he could play at Kansas. And then I think that's kind of what KU in an ideal world would do with a lot of kids. You look at someone like Bryson Hayes from Wichita, you know, he's someone KU spent a lot of time recruiting and he went to camp last summer, really ran fast and really impressed. And the coaches got to work with them and see how he takes coaching and they fell in love with them and they've been recruiting him really hard. You know, Andrew Babalola from um, Blue Valley Northwest, you know, KU's out on him now, but, he was one that went to camp and KU wanted to see him camp and offer him there. So I think this local recruiting, it's such a uh, double-edged sword, right? Because if you're an early offer, but you don't recruit the guy, well, then you're going to get negatively recruited because, oh, well, why aren't you recruiting instant kids? But then if you're slow to offer and you wait your time and make sure you like the evaluation where you want to recruit the guy, then people say, oh, well, you know, why are you so slow to offer? Well, what took you so long? Why are all these other out-of-state schools coming in and offering guys? So it's kind of a double-edged sword to some degree when it comes to in-state recruiting, and it's going to kind of depend on what side you want to argue on. So I think KU continues to put in a lot of effort, and it's just going to take winning more football games on Saturdays in the fall to really consistently be in these in-state recruiting battles. We're joined by Michael Swain of Fog Dot Net 24-7 Sports here on the Fleming Place Wine and Spirits Hotline. Uh, Coach Leipold spoke earlier today. He confirmed that uh, transfer tight end Deshaun Haneke was shut down for the rest of spring. Uh, kind of the rumors online are a torn Achilles. How big of a blow is that, and could he miss time into the season? Yeah, I, I, you know, I, the surgery word got brought up, and that typically isn't good. So it's a big loss because, you know, KU went out and got a Deshaun Haneke because they thought he could be an impact player. and. He's someone that didn't play last year at Iowa State because he, you know, because of the, the gambling stuff that happened around the program, and he was never fully charged of anything, um, and was cleared to play by the Big Twelve. So he was someone that was having a really good spring and was going to be, you know, arguably maybe Katie's best receiving tight end this fall, and would have been a, a big person to replace the production left by Mason Fairchild. And not having him now, you know, you look at the room and you say Trevor Cardell and Jared Casey, and you're like, okay, you know, those are two guys that have been around right, for several years, and it's just going to come down to can KU stay healthy, and Cardell is not someone that has stayed healthy over the last few years, and it's really going to come down to that, because if an injury does happen to either one of those, then you're really looking at, you know, a redshirt freshman, and, you know, maybe Quentin Connolly, Jaden Hamm, um, or maybe an experienced guy in Tabita Noah, and just the guys that just don't have a lot of seasoning, and if you're talking about a Kansas team that, again, wants to go on and compete and win the Big 12, like, not having a quality tight end when you want to run wide zone, um, who could also be a receiving threat, is not ideal. So it really is a big injury for KU in that position that, yes, they do have quality players, but just the depth takes a big hit, and depth is crucial in college football. And tough, especially here in town. I know a lot totally. of a lot of folks around Topeka were really excited to see Deshaun back uh, nearby playing at KU, so a huge bummer for him. Hopefully – medical red shirt maybe for 25 that's got to be the hope there if he doesn't decide to leave college yeah. uh wanted to ask you by the way michael uh jd jalen daniels how did he look this spring yeah yeah so it's kind of been a slow burn where you know if you go to practice and you watch the first couple practices that you know i was a little concerned you know he wasn't doing a ton there were certain drills where he wasn't participating and now at this point in spring he is participating in a whole lot more you're seeing him throw in the run twist and throw and have torque in his back you know I, I don't believe he's taking like a bunch of first team reps in terms of the, the live periods when you know the bullets are flying but in terms of doing more being able to throw being able to do more of those drills that you know will put more strain on your back he has been able to do that and Lance Leipold has been pretty adamant KU is very much focused on having him ready for late August into September October November rather than having him running around chucking it you know in April when it doesn't really matter. So it seems like things are positive, and, and I think that's all you can hope for. And I think Key fans will hope that in August he'll be at every practice. I imagine Cole Ballard is nailed on as the number two right now ahead of Isaiah Marshall. 
Yeah, I think so, right? Experience is a huge thing, and Cole Ballard has the experience, even if it's just a little bit over Isaiah. And look, the future is incredibly bright for Isaiah Marshall. And when it comes to this fall, I think the best thing that can happen is that Jalen Daniels plays 13, potentially plus, like some cave fans would like, right? 13 plus games. And, you know, maybe Cole Ballard's in there for some mop up duty in some non con And that allows Isaiah Marshall to redshirt, extend the college career and maybe create a little bit better of a, a bridge there from, from Jalen Daniels to Isaiah Marshall. So I think right now, yeah, Cole Ballard probably quarterback two for KU. Michael Swain covers the Kansas Jayhawks for Fog.net. He was plugging VIP earlier. Go be a VIP at 24-7 Sports. You get all sorts of great inside information on what's going on with KU football and basketball. And make sure you follow Michael on Twitter as well, at mswain 247 Appreciate it as always, Michael. We'll talk to you soon, man. Awesome. Sounds great. Talk to you guys next week. That's Michael Swain from Fog.net. Great, great, great insight into all things Kansas basketball. We've got one hour left on 580 Sports Talk today. And coming up in the final hour of the show, we've got today's 580 Sports Talk headlines, including news on a former Kansas basketball player. We'll also preview tonight's first game between the Royals and the Astros. Plus, we've got more of your texts and more of your YouTube comments as well. Of course, the texts come into the Top City Metal Supply text line, 785-272-9429. Don't forget, if you haven't gone over to YouTube to watch the video stream of the show, you can also find it on our website, 580wibw.com. You can find it on the WIBW News Facebook page. And if you're on Twitter, you can even find it there. Go to 580 Sports Talk on Twitter. You can find the video and send us a, uh, a follow while you're there. Why not? We've got one hour left of 580 Sports Talk coming up after the news.
now the final hour of 580 Sports Talk going up on a Tuesday. Brendan, Dan, Spencer here with you for the final hour of the show today. Thank you for spending some of your afternoon hours with us. The Top City Metal Supply text line is still open, 785-272-9429. You can also find us on YouTube. 580 Sports Talk is the name of our YouTube channel. Vance on YouTube uh, informed me earlier we're up to 476 now for our total number of subscribers on YouTube. Hey, now. So, uh, yeah, you you take a couple days vacation in a little bit. Yes, that joke has already been made as well. Yeah, we'll get up to 500, no problem. Yeah. I don't know what it is, but that's fine. I'll live with it. Uh, that is that is the cr- my cross to bear, I guess. Uh, YouTube comments are open. Top City Metal Supply text line is open throughout the rest of the show. You might be able to flip that here uh, in the beginning of June. Yeah, I mean, uh, we're all going to take a little time off, I think, uh, during summertime. I know I'm taking like eight days off at one point. I got a big family trip going on. So uh, there's a chance we might get to 1,000 while I'm gone. <laughs> <laughs> we might be able to double the whole thing. I was just saying Dan's going to be gone for a little bit. Well, so... Dan, Dan's going to take some vacation time. I'm sure you're going to take a little time as well. Uh, it's Normally, see, this year is going to be a rarity when actually we're going to miss a little time. And it's like, dang, I want to talk about the Royals. Normally, it's like <laughs> vacation cannot come soon enough. It really does have that feel of they're going to get us to training camp. So, yeah, I uh, I look, whatever it takes to get more people to check out the YouTube, I'm fine with it. 5 Sports Talk on YouTube is where you can find us. Before we get to today's headlines and some Royals talk, your text, your YouTube comments, it is time for today's final. Alpha Media Choose Your Trip Contest Keyword of the Day. 580WIBW.com. Click on the Choose Your Trip link. It is the second link down the page. You'll see it. It's very easy to see. Enter this keyword between now and 6 o'clock. On the dot, 6 o'clock, this keyword will no longer work. So you have to enter it right now. The keyword is cash. C-A-S-H. Cash. Like Washburn baseball third baseman Cash J, who just had an RBI, I believe, moments ago uh, against Northwest Missouri State. So go enter Cash. That is the keyword for the five o'clock hour for the Alpha Media Choose Your Trip contest at 580WIBW.com. Where would you choose to go? Straight Cash, homie. Randy Moss? Yeah. Where would I choose to go? Um, If it's strictly in the United States, um, I would have really, I, I was going to go up to the Pacific Northwest. Mm-hmm. Uh, I had planned a trip there in the summer of 2020 and that didn't happen. Um, I, I would, I hadn't like bought anything and have to get anything refunded. I was just, I was going to go there and then I didn't, uh, but I would like to go visit like Seattle, Puget Sound. Um, I'd also like to do like New England. Haven't really done that. Uh, I think I'd enjoy DC a lot uh, to, to visit uh, as well. Maybe not so much when it's so humid in the summer, but uh you know, those are those would be I'd choose from one of those three if it's uh, if we're keeping it in the United States. Um, anywhere with the beach. You, you you send me anywhere with the beach. I'm fine in the U.S. Sam makes a good point though. Cooperstown is a good answer, particularly when they're putting Todd Hilton in this summer. Yeah, so, that's a good one. Man, now I wish I were eligible for this thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, if we're going international here, I also had a trip planned for summer of 2020. I had a trip. I had paid for my Airbnb and my flight to Paris. I was going to go spend a week in Paris. Wow. And uh, then the pandemic happened and uh, that didn't happen. And the person who rented my Airbnb also refused to refund me. Uh, so that was great. That sucks. Yeah, That's that was ridiculous. really frustrating. I left a one star review and had some very not very uh, nice things to say about her in English uh, or Australia. I've always wanted to go to Australia. Yeah, mine would stay domestic here. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'd probably go to do the Hollywood experience. Okay. Maybe early spring, late fall. Yeah. Definitely not the summer. I've only been to LA once connecting through LAX and one because I got marooned there and they had to put me up in a hotel. Yeah, I was supposed to go summer of 2019. We were supposed to go as a family because I my mom has family close to okay. LA and uh, couldn't go, got sick, just stuff happened in the family, couldn't go. So then we're like, we'll go after you graduate, Spencer. Uh <laughs> And then I was supposed to go to L.A. for an awards conference uh, for the National Broadcasting Society. And uh, that was supposed to be like March 15th of 2020. Well, and uh, the university said, no, no, no. LAX is a big international hub. Well, maybe all of us will get to go to these respective places. Fairly mild summers out west, by the way. I don't think you have to 
duck not not nearly the issues with humidity quite as much as you southeast uh get the ocean portion breeze. of the united states yeah yeah we just got a disturbing california text. summers are very pleasant we just got a disturbing text about your uh your trip that you planned Dan, uh, brennan all right well, i gotta pull this up from the top city metal supply text line 785-272-9429 you should burn down the eiffel tower <laughs> i probably am not going to do that yeah i would love to go this summer for the olympics i've always wanted to go to the olympics that is one i would love to go to i've got a buddy who's going he got tickets to go see, I don't even remember. I have to go look up what he was going to see. I, I would love to go to Paris to see the Olympics, though. Did you see today they're putting the rings on the Eiffel Tower? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Eiffel Tower is cool. It's fine. It's, like, not something I would probably need to go see again, but it, it's cool. It's worth seeing. All right, let's get to some sports. Let's get to today's 580 Sports Talk headlines. First headline for me today the rape charge against former Kansas basketball player Arterio Morris has been dismissed due to insufficient evidence. Uh, this is the writing of Chris Condi from the Lawrence Journal World and KUSports.com. Uh, Morris had been charged in Douglas County District Court with one felony count of rape in connection with an incident back on August 28th with an 18-year-old woman at KU's basketball dormitory. Morris was scheduled for a preliminary hearing in March, but was instead entered into mediation talks with the DA's office. A status conference was scheduled for Wednesday for the parties to update the court about the negotiations, but it was canceled with a note that said case dismissed. The state, represented by Deputy DA Joshua Seiden, filed a motion to dismiss, citing insufficient evidence. He was suspended. Morris was after the allegations were made public and he was dismissed from the KU basketball program after being charged in September. He never played a regular season game for KU, but did play for the team during the trip to Puerto Rico last summer. Uh, he went on to be enrolled at Garden City Community College for 10 minutes in afternoon, maybe like like lunch, essentially. And uh, was then also released from that program. It was insane that they ever brought him in in the first place. Um, Look, I I don't really know that I have a strong opinion on this, to be completely honest with you. Um, being insufficient evidence is not exactly like a strong signal of innocence or guilt, for that matter. It's just we, we don't have enough to go on here. Um, the allegations against Morris when he was at Texas as a freshman were horrifying. You heard my thoughts back when KU got the commitment from him Last summer, when he transferred to KU, I was upset that KU not only brought him to campus, I'm upset that they were recruiting him in the first place. I wish Bill Self had never done that. I think it was a major mistake. And I think KU sort of reaped what it sowed with that situation this year. And uh, I'm sure someone will give him a chance at some point. I do not think it is going to be in the Sunflower State. And I think that is best for all parties. And I will leave it at that before I wade into some dangerous territory here. But the charge against, um, Arterio Morris has been dismissed. Yeah, that's probably as good a place to leave it yeah. as any. We'll keep it moving to our next headline. The viewership numbers have been released for both the men's and women's NCAA basketball championship games. And for the first time ever, more people watched the women's final than the men's final. You may have seen the number late yesterday evening. The women game, which the women's game, which was a 2 p.m. Central, 3 p.m. Eastern tip off on ABC on Sunday afternoon did 18.9 million viewers peaking at 24 million viewers. So the 18.9 million is an average figure. That is the most that have ever watched a women's championship game. It is nearly double the 9.9 .9 million who watched last year's championship game also on ABC. The men's game last night on the Turner family of cable networks. Uh, it was broadcast on TBS and TNT. I'm not sure if it was on True TV or not. It was because yeah. when you use YouTube TV, it gives you all the options to yeah, which one you want to watch. So it was on all of the Turner uh, or at least the most prominent Turner cable networks. 14.8 million viewers, which is a decrease from last year's viewership number. So. There you have it. Uh, the, the women's game did a bigger number and, and a substantially bigger number than the men's game. And I think if there's a lesson to be learned here, it's that 
people enjoy sports and people will not not watch sports just because it's women playing it. If you have compelling figures and a compelling story and a compelling matchup and you take the time to tell that story, you will get people interested. That is the lesson of the explosion of growth in women's basketball interest the last few years. The audience was always there. It was just nobody was bothering to tell the story in a way that would sweep up other people. And now you've got an audience. And uh, I I don't know that this will be the last time. Now, I, I don't think it's going to be a regular occurrence. Uh, th- there might not be a Caitlin Clark every single year. But I think you're going to start to see a lot more comparable viewership numbers for the men's game and the women's game on a year-over-year basis. I think you combine that with you combine the fact that the women's game this year seemed to, with Caitlin Clark and South Carolina and, you know, everything in there. Well, also the fact that it's a Sunday afternoon peak viewing time for a normal person, and it not was, 930 Eastern. Yeah. It, like, I think you lose viewers at 930 Eastern. Definitely too late to tip off for the men. I would argue too early for the women to tip off, honestly. Like, Oh, I agree with that. They're, I agree it's early, but you have a better window. Yes, like it's it's benefited from a good, a better time window than the men's game. But still, if that were if it were that simple, then we would have seen the women's game outrate the men's game for a few years running now, because uh, that, that's when the women played their championship game last year too. So uh, first time ever, and uh, may not be the last. I wouldn't count on it being a regular occurrence. Like there will certainly be years where uh, you get like Duke and Kentucky or Kansas and North Carolina play for a national championship. And that'll do crazy numbers. Duke, Duke always does numbers, Uh, but uh, noteworthy certainly in, in sports history that that happened for the first time. Yeah. I I do wish we had been able to make a more one-to-one compare. Like I'm I'm not trying to tear down the women's game for doing it. Like the most compelling most compelling athlete in America right now is, is Caitlin Clark. I don't really think there's much of an argument about that, to be completely honest with you. They still probably would have had the better number, but the fact that it was one on broadcast TV, one on, one on cable, the time different. I mean, I, I, I'm not trying to tear it down. It's, it's incredible, and it's awesome that the game has taken that big of a step, and I think that's a... I think that's a fair way to put it. I would say uh, w- somebody asked a fair question on the uh, on the Top City Mail Supply text line from 785. Do you think UConn fatigue played a factor? Like people saw yes. UConn win last year. Did a bigger number on cable this year than it did last year on CBS to see UConn win. And I think that last year, I think there was two things that happened. One, you had San Diego State, a mid-major. Yeah. And two, you had the perception all year long that it was not a very good tournament, that there were no great teams in college basketball. And this year, although it was not the most compelling of men's basketball tournaments, what you got in the championship game was the two best teams. Like, there was was no question about that, that the two best teams played for the national championship. That was the case in the women's game as well, Mm -hmm. but it was definitely the case in the men's game. So the fact that it did a bigger number despite being on cable instead of being on big CBS uh, suggests that it was not necessarily UConn fatigue. It was, in fact, a, a better number than they might have gotten uh, due to uh, its placement on cable and its late tip-off because the storyline was compelling to have the two best teams playing against each other. I think the thing it tells me is that more, you know, we talk about the casual fan. I think more casual fans probably watched Iowa than whoever UConn was going to play because yes. I think I think it was more interesting. You You had... You had a better narrative, honestly. I mean, there's the, the narrative is not so juicy when it's UConn has beaten everybody's brains in the entire tournament and Purdue has a tall guy. It's still Purdue. Whereas Caitlin Clark is going to score 30 points and will her teammates be enough to overcome the behemoth that is the best program in the country right now and has been for over three years. That, that is a more interesting narrative to a casual fan. I, I could see that. I don't think there's a whole lot of argument for that, honestly. UConn was fun, but Caitlin Clark is more fun than anyone in basketball right now. I think uh, I want to give uh, one of our YouTube uh, live chatters the last word here. I think Christopher makes a good point. There was a Caitlin effect, but people are starting to appreciate women's basketball oh, yeah. on its own merits as a different game that can be enjoyed. It was a good game. This is a really entertaining basketball game. What do you got for us, Spencer? Uh, this just coming down a few moments ago, like 10 minutes ago, from Adam Zagoria. He is reporting of the New York Times 
and New Jersey online, I believe. Uh, he is reporting that Kentucky is actually targeting and zeroing in on Scott Drew to become their next head coach. Uh, he's also said, let me pull up. It, I lost it there. I believe uh, that Billy Donovan is not interested right now due to the NBA season. Yeah, I, I, I said this earlier. I'm going to reiterate it again. If, you, if you're one of the people who likes to bet on things like coaching searches and you think Billy Donovan's the guy, give me your money. Give me your money. I will make more use of it than the sports books will. Billy Donovan is not going to coach Kentucky. The guy who has already twice in his career turned down Kentucky is not going to leave the NBA to go to Kentucky. It's apparently, not going to happen. Apparently, Donovan was also asked about that as his press availability just a few minutes ago, uh, according to Cody Westerland of 670, the score who covers the Bulls, uh, when asked about the Kentucky opening, this per his tweet, Billy Donovan says he hasn't been contacted by anyone and his full focus is on the Bulls. Yes, that's not going to happen. He's not He's not going back to college. Uh, there are Kentucky fans in Adam Zagoria's Twitter mentions right now who are saying, bro, you don't know what you're talking about. It's going to be Danny Hurley first, then Donovan has to say no. Nate, from Twitter, I recommend that you get the internet and uh, learn something about basketball first. Um, I'm sure they're going to try to get Danny Hurley. I'm, I'm certain they will. He said he's not interested. I mean, if if you're Kentucky, you you tell him what do you want? What will it take to get you to Lexington, Kentucky? And if he says I want forty five million dollars, you say okay, I have boosters to call. Like that that's what you do if you're Kentucky. Until yeah. he tells you there is nothing you can do to get me there. Well, I think it kind of changes too. Like if he wanted to, like his son's done. I don't think his son could be at Kentucky. Like, I don't think his son could be on the roster at Kentucky. No. Like, a Big East and, and the SEC are two different animals. Um, when it comes no, to Brad the, Calipari played for Kentucky. I guess so, yeah. Yeah, no, I, that, that, I mean, the Big 12 is better than both those leagues, and Tyler Self was at KU for five years. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know how much that actually changes, but, um, yeah, I, I do think it'll be Scott Drew. I said that earlier. I think it'll be Scott Drew for the, getting the job. For the record, the sportsbook bet online has Scott Drew plus 160 as the betting favorite to be the next Kentucky wow. basketball coach. That's pretty short. Billy Donovan plus 200, Dan Hurley plus 350. Then this domino effect. Uh, Baylor has an opening. I know that that is where the real intrigue comes into me. Especially here in our local area. Exactly. I don't think Jerome Tang's going to Baylor. Um, but I do think that uh, it would behoove Kansas State to make sure Inc. gets on that contract extension. I will be 100% convinced of that once I get the press release from uh, Tom Gilbert at K-State yes. that there is a new contract. Yes. And I think... I don't want to say that there is a reason that there has not been a press release for that yet, but I think it's possible there hasn't been a press release for a reason yet because there was some knowledge that maybe that could happen. Right. And, and this is not an attempt to, to fear monger, but obviously Jerome Tang was an assistant there for almost two decades. Yeah. I, it's just, we, we talked about this just on yesterday's show. Like it is what it is. When, when you've got a coach like that, who is desirable and has those connections, these things happen. Next headline for me on today's 580 sports talk headlines, some updates. Let's just stay with college basketball. Shall we? Some updates to the transfer portal. Plenty of players who are in the mix. Arizona's Kylan Boswell, guard, averaged nine and a half points per game over six rebounds, was it, this season? Um, the early scuttlebutt is that that one's already a done deal to Illinois. He grew up in Champaign, Illinois. Would not be surprised at all. They need some guard help with Taryn Shannon leaving. So I would not be surprised if Kylan Boswell does end up there. Robbie Avila, or Avila, excuse me. Larry Blurred or Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Milk Chamberlain. Whatever you want to call him, he is in the portal. He entered with a do not contact tag. I he's going to St. Louis. He's going to St. Louis. Yeah. Uh, he's going to go follow his head coach. Um, Tobe, is that Tobe Awaka? Yeah, Tobe Awaka. From, from Tennessee. I want Tennessee. to make sure I got his name right. Uh, he is in the portal. Seth Trimble from UNC. He is in the portal as well. Some guys who didn't do... Uh, a whole lot for their pretty darn good teams last year. One other name to note. This is a name that if you are inclined to believe the boards and the scuttlebutt, this is a name I would potentially keep an eye on if I was a Kansas State Wildcats fan. Because one of his best friends in the entire world is current Kansas State guard Taj Manning. Mark Mitchell 
who was a five-star recruit, top 10 recruit in the country, if I'm not mistaken, yeah, a time, year ago. Big-time player, formerly uh, out of Bishop Meage. And spent a year at Sunrise Christian yeah. and then ended up at Duke. Duke's got best recruiting class in the country coming in, led by Cooper Flagg. He entered the transfer portal earlier on today. I have seen, again, this is just scuttlebutt. This is nothing affirmative. Saw today from Eric Bossy over at 24-7 Sports that K-State has done some legwork already on someone who they've already had some familiarity with from last year, and that K-State is a potential option. And it's going to get messy because there are a lot of schools that are going to want someone who had that kind of recruit pedigree. I also saw him say, uh, if you're a KU fan, don't waste your time. That it, it, it ain't happening. It's just, it wouldn't be a fit. Roster wouldn't make sense. It, he will not be a Kansas Jayhawk. But K-State, maybe a team worth at least considering. And I tell you what, he can't really shoot. But uh, that kind of athlete, you put him at the four, suddenly things become a whole lot more interesting for that team. I really like Mark Mitchell. Anytime I've watched Duke, he's always stood out to me as a guy who's making a winning play or a right play. I, I, I don't think he's a superstar by, by any stretch of the imagination. He's not a 15, 20 point a game guy. He's not going to do things that light up a box score, but he's going to do all of those things that allow everybody else around him to light up a box. Like I really like the player. He's I, got gravity. Yes. Uh, he he just he, he seems like a smart player, unselfish player, and uh, he's going to make whoever he plays for next season better. There just was going to be the the, the minutes were going to be short for him at Duke next year. That's why he's leaving. Mm. And again, I'm not trying to report something that you can't go find on these websites yourself. I'm I'm just saying Eric Bossy, who is really good at this, said. That is a pl that is a team, Kansas State, that is going to be at some point in the mix for Mark Mitchell. And if they could get a player like Mark Mitchell, again, that is a much more interesting team going into next season. No doubt about that. One final headline for me, the expectation is that there will be some big dominoes in the football transfer portal. The second football transfer portal window is about to open up, and there are a lot of people who are tied in across college athletics who expect to see some pretty significant names hit the football transfer portal. One of them did today. Oregon State's star running back, Damian Martinez, uh, has announced he'll be entering the transfer portal. Of course, Oregon State is kind of a team without a country right now. They they did not get a, a invite into a new league, so uh, they are kind of adrift right now outside of the Power 5 football structure. That being said, it is reported that Oregon State's boosters put together an NIL package worth around $400,000 to keep Damian Martinez at Oregon State. And that was effective through the first transfer portal window, but apparently not this one. So he is going portaling. So is a potential stud at defensive line, Bear Alexander, out of USC. So a couple of notes here. One, and Pete Thamel had that number on Damian Martinez, which is certainly more reliable than on threes NIL valuation tool, which is literally just a guess there. There's absolutely no value to that, to be completely honest with you. Um, that tells me that someone got in his ear and told him, what are you getting paid at Oregon state? And we will match it or beat it for you to come play for us. He's a good player. Oregon state has had 15 or had this past season, 15 all pack 12 players on their roster that made one of the teams or an honorable mention 15, one, is now slated to return this year. Wow. That sucks. I feel yeah. so, so bad for them. They were fun to watch last year, too. Uh, I also saw someone I know who's tapped into uh, West Coast college football who said, uh, Bear Alexander, he used two words to describe his transfer, and it was bag chaser. <laughs> so, uh, But, I mean, in the long run, aren't we all? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I mean, I, I it's hard for me to fault that. I know people don't like that, but I... It is what it is. That, that, that's the business now. Quite literally, that is the business. That does it for 580 Sports Talk headlines for today. Coming up, we've got more 580 Sports Talk, including a look ahead to Royals Astros later on tonight. That's coming up here on 580 Sports Talk.
Brendan Dan and Spencer here with you on 580 Sports Talk. Thanks for hanging out with us today. We got some Royals baseball coming up a little bit later on tonight. It's kind of weird that college basketball is over. This felt like a little bit of a weird season. I mean, when you when the Chiefs go as long as they do, it is always a little strange because they take up so much of everyone's brain space that then, oh shoot, we're really deep into college basketball season. Yes. Like second week of February. Like it's the conference title race is largely in focus at this point. Um, but yeah, it's it's always weird when it ends. Are you a one shiny moment guy or are yeah, you a hater? I watch it. I like Luther though. Like yeah. Luther Untouchable, one of my dad's favorites, Luther Vandross. Did yeah. you stay up to watch One Shining Moment? Uh, I mean, I don't watch it on TV. I wait for it to go on Twitter because, you know, it's there. I will say it felt like last night's game. I don't know if it's because it was, what, like a 17-point, 15-point game, whatever. It yeah. just felt like it went by quick. I Okay, I thought the same thing. Because, like, it, it ended at, what, I think, like 10 or 10 15 or so wasn't really 10 20 i think it was 10 20 something it wasn't much of, per, of a parade to the free throw line there weren't yeah. as many timeouts because like matt painter could have called 20 timeouts and he couldn't have solved the problems that were going to get his team beat it was just right around two hours and i feel like tournament games especially the championship are closer to two and a half than two yeah people were getting really preemptively mad at the men's game when the women's game was going on sunday so they can get a game done in an hour and 53 minutes remember that when the men's game takes three hours. Well, it took barely two hours. Well, That's... that being said, those people are right about one thing. It is past time for the men's game to go to quarters. I can't give it up. I, I, I it is, and, and, and it feels like the only reason we're not doing it is to save the extra media time out each half. I will say, admittedly, even as someone who has been on team save halves, going from doing an MIAA game where you have media timeouts at 15, 10, and 5, as mm -hmm. opposed to 16, 12, 8, 4, Ooh, the flow is a lot different. I, I will saying. admit it. I and will it's not it. just the game flow. It's also the fouls. Like, the way fouls work in quarters is so much better. It's not even close, frankly. It's not even close. Because how many games do you see where... You know, the officials let some things go in the first half a little bit. And then in the second half, they go, whoa, we got to pull the reins in on some of this physical play. And then one team's in the bonus with like 1430 to play in the second half. And the second half just becomes a parade to the free throw line. That sucks. That sucks when that happens. I will say there's a clear difference in division one, the division two, when it comes to like the emphasis of how long an actual timeout is. Well, yeah, like, but that's because it, they don't have like multi billion Nissan dollar commercials TV, during D2 games. I, I know, but I came from a place that we televised Shepherds games and we had to literally every game go to the referees and say, we need the full time you can give. And half the time they never did it. And we would have to like stand on the field with the ref with our sideline reporter for football. Okay. Now that's very strange because like the MIAA, it's you get a minute 15. Every break is exactly a minute 15. They go like, 55 to 60. Wow. All right. You now have that... to hold. And like when we do 60 second break, when we did 60 second breaks, we'd have to like hold them and then let them go. And we get back and they'd be like kicking off the ball right as the camera came on. We have dealt with that with high school broadcasts. Yes. That, that happens, but that's also a, yeah, a slightly yeah, different not, product. Yeah. Six, yeah. Not 60 seconds uh, from the extra point to the kickoff. <laughs> Sometimes you're lucky if it's 45. Yeah. Make it a 30. <laughs> a little in, inside baseball for you there. Um, but yeah, I, I thought the flow of the game was was fine. Here's the thing about the, the foul problem. You're going to take the one and one for my cold, dead hands. I love the one and one. I'm not giving it up. I enjoyed one of the one and ones yesterday when Zach Eady airballed <laughs> the one and one. And you could see in the background the UConn like end of bench guys absolutely lose their minds. That's when the game was over for me. <laughs> uh, you could have just called it there. I don't remember what the score was. I know UConn was up. You could have just called the game. It was over. Yeah, there was like four, four and some change left, and I was like, all right, it's basically over. Like, come on, come on. It just, they never got back. They are suffocating. They UConn is the anaconda plan. They wrap around, they cut off all your supplies, all your outs, and they just choke the life out of you. And it's with... Good basketball. It's not with pack line defense. Yeah. It is with good 
quality, well-coached, well-executed basketball. And that's the thing. You can complain about Dan Hurley and his sideline antics as much as you want. Dude, Dude justifiably. An awesome coach. Yes. An awesome coach. As X's and O's go, as good as anybody. And they are some ethical hoopers. Up and yeah. down the lineup. Yeah, they're, all they're, those dudes can ball. Yeah, there, there's no flopping. There's no head whack. There's no grifting their way to the free throw line. No. They just run their stuff, and they get good shots, and they defend as a team, and they really are a pleasure to watch play. Like, And, and it's not a surprise. Like, They just nuke. It's two tournaments in a row. They've not just won games. They've won big. It, yep. To win 12 NCAA tournament games in a row, by 13 or more points is as impressive as any accomplishment in the history of college basketball to me. Yeah. I mean, they've been, they've been on an unbelievable heater as of late. I, I give them a ton of credit for what they have been able to build in a pretty quick amount of time. I mean, two first round exits and then back-to-back -back titles for Hurley. That's that really is incredible. Um, I saw something today. He's real weird. I, he's a bizarre guy. I saw someone say, that the real mastermind behind Danny Hurley's success is his wife, Andrea, who they talked about on the broadcast, I swear, as much as they talked about Danny last night. She's also, not only that in the Final Four game, too. Yeah, they talked about her a lot. And she's also the reason he's not taking the Kentucky job. Well, yes, there's the other thing. I, I saw a UConn fan say today, there are about nine people on earth who could get Danny Hurley to act like a normal human being. <laughs> she is one of them, and the other eight all also went to Seton Hall. Like that's he's just a very odd, strange guy. While we have a moment, speaking of Danny Hurley, may I bring up this Greg Doyle column? Yes. Greg Doyle is a columnist for the Indianapolis Star. Uh, you've probably read so he's been around forever. Forever, forever. He had a column today about Danny Hurley and about the the antics and the sideline stuff for Danny Hurley. And I've got to pull up the the full headline here of the story because the star is um, fully paywall. There's not a very easy way to get around it. But here is in part what the headline essentially is. Purdue lost, but Purdue had class. Danny Hurley did not. And thus, who are the real winners? This is what Doyle tweeted this morning. I saw two or three things that I've not seen written anywhere else. I was sitting front press row, straddling half court. Great seat, and I saw what I saw. Unbelievable class from Matt Painter and just ridiculousness from Dan Hurley. Ball don't lie. First of all, you old doofus, that's not what ball don't lie means. So don't right. use a phrase you don't know what it means. <laughs> Second of all, you want a cookie? Good, awesome, cool for Matt Painter. He lost with dignity, he lost. Yes, yes, that's what losing with class is, is losing. I, I, I mean, that, maybe that's not the lesson we want to teach, like, young people. But, yes, losing with class is just losing. And here's the thing. Danny Hurley would deserve a whole lot more criticism if after the game, during the handshake line, he walked up to Matt Painter and was like, suck it, nerd. <laughs> Get your big fat boy off the floor. See you next year with the other tall doofuses. That would be, that would deserve ridicule. Yes. The dude's yelling and posturing. Have you ever coached against Shaka Smart? Like, th this is no worse than watching the average Shaka Smart game. Yes, like some people, competitive people, just kind of lose their minds for the 40 minutes or 60 minutes or nine innings or whatever it is that comprise a sporting event. And it's not flattering, and I don't think it flatters Danny Hurley, and I do think it is fair to criticize Hurley's sideline antics. But... If your takeaway from a championship game is, well, at least we lost with dignity. You lost, man. Like that. Nobody wants to read that chicken soup for the soul ass column the day after you lose the national championship game. A buddy of mine who is a Purdue fan and grad. I, I made fun of this Doyle column earlier. And he told he said to me on Twitter, my, my buddy. It's bad, man. There's been, I think, two separate writers with comments about Hurley. And I get he's not everyone's cup of tea, but it just looks like nothing but sour grapes. Yes. Shout out to my guy, Brett. A very normal, level-headed take from a Purdue fan. Like, you don't need to do this, man. You don't need to pander with the, well, we won. We lost with class, so we're the real winners. No, you lost. Yeah. You lost. Give me a break. That stuff is so weak. Coming up next, the Kansas City Royals play the Houston Astros, a pair of games 
or a game today, tomorrow night, and then an afternoon game on Thursday. We'll preview the series, preview tonight's game coming up on 5 Sports Talk. Five forty six here on five eighty sports talk, wrapping things up today. Coming up tomorrow, Tim Fitzgerald is going to join us for the Wildcat wrap up. We are hoping at some point this week, I'm hoping it's tomorrow, might be later in the week. We'll keep you updated on this. Our good friend Michael Will Hoyt is going to join the show. That's right, the Washburn legend, current Denver Broncos assistant coach. Got the big Kev camp coming up later on this summer. Michael is going to be uh, involved heavily in the community here in the coming weeks and months. Super excited to get to talk to him again, hoping that that'll be sometime tomorrow afternoon. Uh, But we will try to uh, let you know as soon as we know when we'll be able to be joined by Mike later on this week. Short show Thursday. Royals have a day game that day. So we'll be on somewhere in the neighborhood of four o'clock on Thursday afternoon. First game of the set with the Astros is tonight. 6.40 6.40 first pitch, 6 o'clock pregame start time here on the Royals radio network on 580 WIBW. No Framber Valdez for Houston, one of their best starters. Tonight, it will be Cole Reagans for the Royals against Christian Javier for the Strohs. What do you know about Christian Javier? Right-hander, best pitch is a changeup. Uh, if he command, uh, Royals have hit right-hander changeups really hard to start this season. That's according to David Lesky's research. So uh could be a good matchup for the Royals tonight. Tough start for the Astros. They're four and seven, though they did just win back-to-back games in Texas to round out a little wraparound series. Um, they're hitting the ball with plenty of authority. They've got big power in the lineup. Tucker, uh, Jordan Alvarez, of course. Jose Altuve still doing his thing at age 34. Um the, the big problem that they've had early on has been that their three best bullpen arms have ERAs of 7.20, 7.36, and 14.73. And that is, uh, that's how you lose baseball games. And uh, the rest of their bullpens actually pitched okay. And like Josh Hader, Brian Abreu, and Ryan Presley, the three guys I'm talking about, will pitch better than that over the course of mm-hmm. 162. But that's the reason they've uh, struggled to the 
record they have. They are still a, a very good team until proven otherwise. Where would you rank them in the American League? Because I know you picked the M's to win the West, and I would love for my wife's favorite team to win the West. That'd be a lot of fun. I still think it's going to be Houston because it's just a classic, I need to see it before I believe it kind of situation with them. Where would you put them in the hierarchy in the American League? I think going into this season, as I was projecting it out, I would have said Baltimore was the best team. I would have said uh, Seattle, Texas, Houston in some order after that. Okay. So, uh, yeah, like third or fourth. <laughs> Not a great reflection of the Central. No. Well, I mean, come on. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the division stinks. It's It's very bad. Uh, the West, by the way, you see Trout had another big game yesterday. I did. Uh, L.A. six and four. They've got a real life manager in Ron Washington, and maybe that helps them. Maybe maybe they probably play well because they've got a real adult in charge and not uh, the eternally overmatched uh, Phil Nevin. Uh, the White Sox are playing right now. They're one and nine. They are in action. I am hearing reports that Yoan Mankata has suffered another uh injury and it doesn't sound good left adductor strain he'll be reevaluated tomorrow he is likely going to the injured list apparently the white Sox knew he was hurt already and played him today what yeah that is what oh, i am irresponsible yeah this is from a show host on wmvp in chicago mark silverman who says egregious they knew he was hurting and guess what happened today and uh daryl van schuen who covers the white Sox for the chicago sun times said he's been playing through an injury already so that is now Arguably the White Sox three best position players all on the injured list before tax day. Cleveland uh, fell behind early, but uh, trying to rally back. If the uh, if the Guardians win tonight, they will get to nine wins, joining the Yankees, Dodgers, and Pirates as the nine-win teams in the major leagues. Are uh, we surprised the Yankees have nine wins already? A little like, bit without yeah. Cole getting a couple starts That's so what, far. Like, yeah, I, I just feel like it's crazy they're off to this hot start, They've but they're off to really a hot well. start. Yeah. They're going to falter somewhere, and uh, Yankees fans are going to be heard around the world. We, uh, I think it's um, Nestor Cortez went eight innings last night. Yeah, he's off to a good start. He might be getting back to form. Yeah, I, I think they're going to be pretty decent this year. I really do. And when they get Cole back, that's obviously going to help them out a whole bunch. Um, the White Sox, you, you said this the other day, I believe it was, Dan. No one is happier that the A's are an embarrassment than the Chicago White Sox. Yeah, there are a handful of teams that I really believe are willing to let the A's situation devolve into what it has devolved into so that they can be public enemy number one and everybody can look at them and say, that's a joke, that's a disgrace, top to bottom. That's not what a Major League Baseball, a professional franchise should be. Because if we're looking at them, then we're not, they're not looking at us. And I think the White Sox are in that bucket, and I think the Marlins are in that bucket, and I think the Rockies are in that bucket. And uh, it's not a bucket you want to be in, but no. I think that those teams are in that bucket. And maybe we... it's amazing the Pirates aren't. Yes, it really is. <laughs> Historically speaking, they've always been, well, post 1970s, we are family pirates. They've always been in that, but my whole lifetime. Well, we'll see if Michael A. Taylor can keep up Michael A. Taylor. His 429 batting average to start this season. How many uh, homers does he have? Zero. I'm going to guess zero. Oh. Yeah. Dang. What do you think his batting average on balls in play is? Uh, Sounds like it might be a thousand. <laughs> uh, Michael A. Taylor, former Royal, his batting average on balls in play is 571. Do you know what his nickname was in Washington? No. Matt. Michael A. Tater. Oh. Because well, he yeah, used to he had... actually hit home runs. And then he hit what? Did he hit 21 a year? I feel like he did. Yeah. He hit one at Coors Field that went like 800 miles. <laughs> oh, dear. Oh, no. Yeah, his career high, he hit 19. Oh, no, I'm sorry. He hit 21 last year. What? <laughs> he hit 220 with 21 home runs for Minnesota. And that's why he's still playing. Yeah. That's Holy why he got God. a contract. Oh, my gosh. We've got to get to one final timeout before Royals baseball. We'll take it here. We'll wrap up with a final word after that.
Final word time here on 580 Sports Talk. Royals baseball is coming up next. We've got a final word first. It is up to you, Spencer, to lead us off with your final word today. Big uh, big hockey game I'll be watching tonight on ESPN. Uh, the Capitals, uh, their playoff efforts are slowly falling away. They had a good stretch, and then they've like just completely collapsed. Uh, but they are playing the Red Wings, who they are uh, against in the seed or in the wild card race. So if they can beat them, that helps them. I think their playoff percentage goes up to like sixty something percent if they uh, win tonight. How have your abs been doing? I feel like I haven't heard anything about them. They were red hot for a bit, and then they've kind of been uneven, and they're not going to win the division, and they're just hoping they get home ice advantage for the first round. They don't have good enough goaltending to do anything in the playoffs. That's a moment. Alexander Georgiev stinks, unfortunately. So, yeah, I, I think it's going to be a pretty short playoff run for my abs, unfortunately. Final word for you? Final word for me. Congrats to UConn, uh, a dynasty. Uh, 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 they're a blue blood program, and that team that we just saw stampede through this postseason – is as good a college basketball team as there has been in this century. And uh, the best I've seen since 2018 Villanova. They were awesome. The According to Keith Taylor, who is the Kentucky beat writer for the Berea Citizen and Kentucky Today, Kentucky has offered their job to Scott Drew. He just reported that moments ago. I don't know if that is true. I don't know if Scott Drew will take it. I think if offered, he would indeed take it. And if that is the case, we are in for a whole lot of excitement in the coaching carousel coming up in the near future. Who that will impact, the player impacts as well. That's going to be fun to follow. I can't believe John Calipari left for Arkansas. That is still just crazy to me. We are back tomorrow with a full show from 2 until 6. Tim Fitzgerald, hopefully Michael Wilhoyt as well. We'll react to the Royals. Plenty more to get to coming up tomorrow on 580 Sports Talk. But until then, for Dan Lucero, for Spencer Dupuy, I'm Brendan Dorzinski. Royals baseball is up next following 580 Sports Talk.